And we're live. So welcome to Stories and Sips Lock-In, our virtual lock-in every Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, or midnight in Ireland, grand and late in Ireland, when everybody should be in bed. They're sitting up with their glass of whiskey, tuning in for uh, for a few more stories and a few more sips to get the weekend started. So thanks, everybody, for joining. I see we've got a, a good few in here already. So we're going to have a good old session this evening. It feels like it's day number 678 of this quarantine, of this lock-in. Um, we'd all prefer to be locked in. We'd all prefer to be locked into a, a pub. I have no doubt about it, preferably in the west coast of Ireland somewhere, somewhere rural where we won't get out till the sun comes up. But in the absence of such a pub and in the absence of such illegal activity, we're instead locked into our homes. So we're going to try and recreate here the, uh, the lock-in. We're going to make a... Uh, a lock-in, a virtual lock-in that hopefully people uh, can can join in and enjoy and share a drink with people that they they uh, that share the same interests with them. Irish whiskey, love of Ireland, and love of Irish whiskey. So we've got three amazing whiskeys that we're going to go through this evening. Um, we're going to taste um, two fantastic whiskeys from W.D. O'Connell um, Whiskey Merchants, and Dahi O'Connell will be joining me shortly. And we are then going to taste Powers John's Lane. So these are the, pull up here, the W.D. O'Connell whiskeys that we'll be trying. And Dahi will lead us through the stories of these and the, the tastes of these to help us understand them. And then we'll move on to Powers John's Lane, a beautiful drop of whiskey. We opened this last night for our Powers uh, Irish whiskey tasting, our virtual tasting that we did for everybody in Ohio. So we had a great old uh, night last night tasting that. Um, I got a head start earlier. I've made a cocktail, a little bit of a heathen. I've made a Powers John's Lane black, uh, Powers John's Lane old fashioned. Uh, so an unusual one there, but a little cocktail to get me started. So um, give me a shout in the comments. Let me know where you're joining from and what you're drinking. Richard is joining us with a what have you got there, Richard? Oh, Jameson Gold Reserve. Good man yourself. Um, you've got some powers raring to go. Good man, Laurie, joining us. William Grass is here in the lock-in as well. Sean Hughes with his drama Powers Gold label. Fair play to you. Uh, let me see. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Peter says the Facebook stream wasn't working for him, so he joined on YouTube. Okay, well, we have lots of people here from Facebook, so hopefully it's all working there as well. Uh, Mrs. Stories and Sips, could you check if we're on the Facebook page and the and the group, mm -hmm. please? Thanks a million. Um, if you are joining from the Facebook group, there is a um, if you want your comments to be seen uh, and your names to be seen when you comment, there is one thing you need to do because uh, Facebook groups are private. Uh, our streaming software doesn't have access to all your details or your name. Just go to streamyard.com/facebook right now, and it'll just authenticate your account. It'll take half a second and you come back in and you can add all of your comments and you'll be uh, visible, no problem at all. Um, and that's only for people who are in the Facebook group, uh, Irish Whiskey Fans of America. Everybody else uh, should be uh, showing up uh, showing up okay. Uh, Gockel is with us here from Germany. Good man, Gockel. Uh, tuning in very late in Germany, no doubt about it. What else have we got? Uh, Paul Kennedy is starting with the Pierce Lions. Patrick Kennedy's got his green spot in Florida. Maureen Linnan has her uh, uh, green spot in Canada. So we've got Florida, Canada, Ireland, Germany, Dublin, Ohio. Greg Lemaitrice is there. Good stuff. All right. So we've got um, yeah, 55, almost 60 of you joining in so far with your with your drops of whiskey. So I'm delighted that everybody is here with us. So um, without uh, further ado, I think we should get into uh, the main thrust of the night. We're going to be tasting these few whiskeys. Actually, before we do, two things I want to... Uh, I want to bring you up to speed on. The first is I want to use these live streams to talk about anything that has happened in the um, in the whiskey world, uh, in the Irish whiskey world, specifically in the past week. Now, of course, all the distilleries are transitioning to the production, for the most part, of hand sanitizer at the moment. So the first thing I want to do is give... Is ...fantastic. Let me add it back in. There I am again. Okay, my video cut out. Um, yeah, so the hand sanitizer is, is being produced by uh, so many of the distilleries in Ireland at the moment. So a big shout out to them. But a couple of bits of whiskey news this week, uh, and they're both from the same company. They're both from JJ Curry. So JJ Curry, of course, is the whiskey bonder based in County Clare in the west of Ireland. And they had two bits of news this week. The first is that 
they can't travel like any other uh, whiskey company. They can't go to whiskey fairs because they, they aren't being uh, held right now. And so they're at home wondering how do they grow their business, but also how do they, how do they uh, ensure that people have access to the whiskey that they want. So JJ Curry did something very uh, interesting this week. They launched a, a crowdsourced blend of whiskey uh, called the Lock-In, which is very appropriate considering we're all on the Lock-In here. Uh, and, and how they're doing that is uh, you can go to their website, which is chapelgatewhiskey.com, and you can send in your details and uh, share your interest, and you'll get some blends of whiskey in the mail, or you'll get some uh, some samples of whiskey that you can suggest uh, would make a good blend. And then there'll be a live stream where JJ Kari or Louise and her team will blend the whiskeys and create the crowdsourced blend called the Lock-In, which will be commercially available. So a great idea a commercially available whiskey that is crowdsourced from Irish whiskey fans. So if you've any interest in that, go check out uh, chapelgatewhiskey.com. Uh, and also they managed to launch a whiskey in the middle of all of this. So despite us being in the middle of a, um, a global pandemic, a Californian store has has teamed up with JJ Curry to get hold of a whiskey um, that has been produced specifically for them. And I'll show you here on the screen. It is called um, Gold Rush. I'm going to hide uh, this Gockel's comment here so you can see this properly. Um, Gold Rush is a, um, a nine-year-old grain whiskey, a blend of, of, of grains um, that is finished in ex mezcal barrels. So that's a really interesting one. Uh, not too far away from where I am in San Diego at the moment. So Folsom, California, uh, maybe made more famous by a Johnny Cash song, but Folsom is selling this um, JJ Curry Gold Rush. So that's, uh, those are two pieces of whiskey news this week. Not a lot else happening in the Irish whiskey world um, due to the, of course, the global, uh, the global pandemic. But uh, hopefully we'll be back on our feet soon. So delighted that everybody is joining in. Um, people wondering where the turtleneck is. It's a bit warm out here now in San Diego today. So instead, I uh, got the old shirt on. Um, so <laughs> uh, sorry if, uh, if I'm disappointing you. We, we need stories and branded uh, turtlenecks. They'll be on their way soon. But I'm really excited because we've got a uh, founder of a whiskey company, uh, a whiskey merchant with us uh, this evening, and I'm going to bring him in, Dahi O'Connell, founder of WD O'Connell Whiskey Merchants. Thanks for joining us, Dahi. Even Barry. Nice to be on with you. Thank you. Even Dahi Barry. joined us all the way from Ireland, and I know it's very late in Ireland, and we are going to taste two whiskeys that Dahi has procured and selected and sourced uh, as part of his company, WD O'Connell Whiskey Merchants. And I hyped this up no end uh, during the week and Dahi was thrilled with the hype. I know about how this episode was going to be focused on converting Barry Chandler to uh, peated whiskey, um, which is no small task because I hate the stuff, but you're going to tell me, you're going to show me why I should love it and you're going to play some tricks on me to get me to love it, uh, which I'm very, uh, I'm very excited to learn more about. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. We'll see about that. Uh, Pete is not for everyone, but um, it, it definitely is. Um, it's just you probably haven't found the right piece of whiskey yet. It's I'd like imagine. They don't like whiskey. Uh, they just have the right whiskey for themselves. So, um, yeah, kind of excited yeah, to bring, in, to bring a piece of whiskey onto the market. So I, I, I'm pretty happy with it and I think it's going down really well. So we'll talk about that, um, Bill Phil, the name of the piece of whiskey in a second, and we'll talk about the first whiskey, which we're going to try in a second as well, which is the, uh, the your 17-year-old single malt Pedro Jimenez cask finish. But um, for those of uh, the audience, especially those based in America who maybe have not heard of W.D. O'Connell, who may have seen some pictures of the bottles or heard a little bit about it, I give us a little kind of introduction as to how you got into this business, because it's fairly recent to my understanding, kind of what led you to it, and give us a little overview of what W.D. O'Connell is. Yeah, so um, my background really was in the F and B trade, um, as you probably know, Barry as well. And uh, I was on the bar side of things for most of it, um, and that kind of where I gauged my my interest in whiskey. Originally, pretty much kind of evolved when I went to Hong Kong at a bar in Hong Kong with some some other guys from Ireland, and I was running that, and I was exposed to a lot of Scotch whiskey and. Um, really excellent Scotch whiskey. It was a guy from Diageo kind of brought me along to some to tasting sessions and, and I got to taste some top top shelf whiskeys that I'd probably never be able to taste again. So um, I just felt uh, I wanted to look into the Irish side of things. Things were kicking off in Ireland back, you know, West Cork were started up and um, 
Cooley was uh, about to be sold to Beam Suntory and a big deal. And um, so I started looking at a distillery and looked at that kind of long and hard, spent a good bit of time and money and effort um, lining everything up. We were very close to, to pulling the trigger on that. And um, we uh, I kind of just backed off it um, for, for multitude of reasons. And um, Kept, kept my foot in a little and um, reached out to John Teeling again about, uh, I suppose, 15 months ago now, 14 months ago, and got the ball rolling. And then we launched last, uh, five months ago, last uh, end of November at Whiskey Live. So um, I felt the independent bottler route was where I wanted to, wanted to go. And uh, it was obviously a cheaper route into the marketplace as well. So what is a a bottler so on the label here very clearly says that you're a whiskey merchant and i think that's a relatively new term in the irish market help us understand what a whiskey merchant is and the difference between a whiskey merchant perhaps and and, and any other whiskey company yeah well i guess a, a merchant and a bottler and a um are, are pretty similar and a bonder right so at the moment i don't have my own bond say like louise and jj Corey or um uh, wayward Irish down in, 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 in Killarney. Um, so I, I felt it is something we're working on at the moment. We're actively pursuing that. So I felt I didn't want to say I was something I, I was planning on being like, I did, you know, kind of, kind of a bit of a stickler for it that way. So I wanted to just pick a, pick a term that, that would be universal and last the length of time that the business lasts. So I felt going down the independent bottler route kind of pigeonholed me a little and I just felt the, the merchant would would do it. So the, the end result is that the end game is that we will be um, an independent bottler on the slash bonder under a merchant umbrella along the lines of what would be well known in Scotland and through Caden Heads, etc. You know, like Gordon MacPhail. So very transparently sourcing good whiskey putting perhaps your own, having your own contribution towards maybe how it's finished or cast or uh, some negotiation or discussion with the distilleries as to what what products you'd like to release is it over the coming years? Absolutely. So for the moment, we're buying already aged whiskeys pretty much. And, you know, we have a little new stock as well. That's new spirit. Um, but predominantly, it's all matured stock. So our hand and act and part in it is just selecting it really the style and maybe applying a finish like in the px uh that we did um where we want to get to is that all our stock will be will be all new make spirit and we'll have a, a hand in the creation then of the whiskey as it as it develops and matures um so we'll be sourcing our own casks from all over europe and, and north america and then we'll also um maybe look at mash bills with some distilleries and uh creating our own blends then from that so then the end goal is to have every drop that you taste will have been um we will have a, a part to play in it from start to finish really so when you launched that it was whiskey live wasn't it that you launched in dublin in november last year or just before yeah. that was it? yeah uh a few people walked me off it <laughs> <laughs> They said, stay away. There's nothing but piss heads there. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I felt, well, they're my kind of people. So, uh, you mean was, whiskey lovers? Is, let me translate for you. You mean whiskey lovers were there? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, and it wasn't anything like that with the interaction we got, the, the, the conversations we had, the interest from people was, was far better than I even ever imagined it would be, you know? So you kicked off with two whiskeys, and we have both of them here. So the first was the um, first one I've got up here is the uh, WD O'Connell Single Malt 17-year-old Pedro Jimenez cask finish. Tell us a little bit about this one because this is the first one you're gonna we're gonna taste together tonight. And I'm gonna crack this open while you tell me a little bit about this. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, so that's a really it's a really interesting whiskey that uh, was distilled in Cooley Distillery back in 2002. Um, May to I think about start of May 2002 and we acquired um, a small batch of that so several uh, several casks and we we married them all together and then we, we uh, import we brought in some Pedro Jimenez casks that we sourced um, and then we revatted them recast them 
And so this is a single batch, but released over, it's going to be released over time. So um, this is batch one and batch one is, a, is going to mature. So there'll be an 18 year old batch one uh, coming out later this year. And there will be a cast strength version at some point also. So we're just working on, on, on the timelines around those now at the moment with everything that's going on, it's kind of had an impact on, on release dates, et cetera. So, um, when you say small batch, um, or a batch release, so this is batch one of a, of a bigger batch, is it? So there's a number of casks. Yeah, that were, yeah because it was multiple, it was multiple bourbon casks that were disgorged and then revashed and recast. They were married together. So I felt I couldn't really call them single cast then, even though that was then a single PX two two five liter PX cast that we that we bottled, if that makes sense to you. But I just felt it would be uh, slightly bending the truth if I said it was a single cast because it was it was made up of multiple casts to start with. So each batch will have. I see here there's 370 bottles in this batch. Would that be around the same size of each batch that you'd release? Uh, no, it'll it'll vary. So it'll probably uh, come down to about 350 or 340. I'd imagine that, that if it stays at that ABV. Um, funnily enough, on that one, there never was 370 bottles. There's only 355. We, we calculated 370 based on our measurements. And then when it got down to the bottling plant, they only bought the 355. So I had already numbered the first 48 going to Whiskey Live with 370 on it. So that was <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, bit of information for you. So it's rarer than it, rarer even again. Even rarer. Um, yeah. So Pet PX, that's clearly on the label here, PX series. Uh, help us understand what does PX mean? Yeah, it's a, it's a sherry, uh, type of sherry, Pedro Jimenez. And, um, uh, unlike its Oloroso counterpart, it's much sweeter, um, imparts a, a different uh, flavor profile, more ripe fruits. Um, can be quite overpowering as well, so you have to kind of get your timing right on it. Um, this particular uh, cask was uh, six months uh, in, in PX, so it spent exactly 17 years in a, in a first fill bourbon. Um, and then when it went into the PX, it was only there six months. And the first three months, I didn't really see much change. Saw a little. So I wasn't even confident that we'd see something like for Whiskey Live on it. And I was kind of two or three months out from Whiskey Live, I was going, okay, the PX is not going to be ready, probably. Um, and I said, right, I better look at an alternative. And I cracked open some of the, the peated whiskey, which I had tasted you know, earlier that year and uh, along with some double malts and pot stills, and I felt the pot still wasn't ready, and I was just blown away by how the peated single malt had come on in such a short uh, uh, space of time, you know? When you, so for 17 years, it's been in bourbon in bourbon barrels and then six months in the in the PX. Were those bourbon barrels or the PX, were they first fill, second fill? Uh, they were all first fill on both counts. All first fill, okay. Um, so six months in the in the the Pedro Jimenez, um, that's interesting. Um, JJ Quigley asks, were any of these Pedro Jimenez casks uh, that Noel Sweeney had any hands on, uh, when he, who was the former master distiller of of Cooley? Yeah, no, because we we only recast them last uh, May, so um, under in Great Northern, where we're keeping the stock at the moment. So um, it would have been Brian Watts up there, Great Northern the distillery manager, would have helped me source them. So help me understand what I should be getting on the nose uh, with the with this seventeen year old single malt. Do you have any of your own there? Yeah, yeah. Let me grab it here. I, I took the liberty oh, to pour one earlier. It is midnight after all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my first one. Normally I'm well on it on a Friday evening doing uh, chipping in with Omar on a Friday night. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you saved yourself for this now. Yeah, I'm I'm working. I tell the missus, you know. Okay, so, that's yeah. fair. So on the nose here, it's pretty fruit forward, I think you'll get. Um, lots of ripe berries. Um, some orchard fruits, a bit. Very rich fruits, isn't there, on the, on the nose? Yeah, very rich fruits, yeah. Um, some light spices. If you give it a bit of time to open up, it just, I don't know, you just poured that, did you? Yeah, yeah, swirling around there, getting a bit of surface area. Yeah. So it's 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 light on the it's like, like it's not hugely pronounced on the nose, so like some other whiskies can be, 
Um, like if you have it in the Glen Kern, for example, I know we have it in lovely two of them. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and if you get the narrower nose, you can get it. You can get it a bit more. But this is a uh, wide base, and this is nice for for getting it opened up over time. You know, so it's not at all overpowering. It it it. No. There's definitely the balance of that PX cuts into that single malt biscuitiness. There's a sweetness and it can maybe almost a nuttiness on the nose too. Yeah, that's that's a really good description there. The biscuitiness is right there. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's subtle. The PX influence is subtle on it. it. Hasn't overpowered it, you know. And that's that's the danger. That's the kind of the risk we're playing with leaving the the rest of the batch a bit longer. You know. I know. Uh, now, when you, so when you leave it a bit longer, it'll be 18 years in bourbon and then still six months in the PX. No, so it's, how, you know? it's a continuation of the same. So it's going to be, you'll see the progression, not just in, in, in years, but the progression through the PX. Okay. The PX influence will, will become more apparent, more longer as well. The influence will be stronger. Um, so it'll probably be just over 18. We're just trying to figure it out at the moment. We, we had planned on doing it exactly when it was 18, but we're just with COVID happening now. Where it's kind I of know. Three years ago, you wouldn't have seen a, a Pedro Jimenez uh, finished whiskey anywhere. Um, but now we have a few on the market, uh, and even coming out of Middleton and Ecklandville, yourselves, PX is making a... a yeah, big I'm a big fan of the PX from Ecklandville. When I was planning this, that was kind of one of the PX12. They had released it maybe just slightly before I kind of was looking at um, I was looking at starting the whiskey and I didn't know, I had the whiskey got, but I didn't know what finish I was going to put on it. Yeah. Uh, it was a really excellent single malt, but I just felt I needed to do something to differentiate it. Obviously there's a lot of coolie stock out there. Um, and I, there was no PX done and, you know, Middleton we were doing PX with the, with the red breast and, um, and the guys in, in Eckenville were doing their PX 12. So there wasn't that, you know, there wasn't going to be too many of us out there at that point in time and it was and also i love sherry so um i just felt that if if i start with it i can continue it so the plan is to bring out a non-age statement px series single malt as well and make that a mainstay in our ah, okay well when you sent this bottle over um as soon as it came in the door i popped the cork um huge fan of a sherry sherry contribution to whiskey huge fan of pedro jimenez uh, my first time trying it was only a year, probably just about a year ago with the, the Dream Cask, Redbreast Dream Cask, with their Pedro Jimenez contribution. Fell in love with that. So I was dying to try this and thrilled that even with a six-month finishing, there's there's absolutely those Pedro Jimenez sweet notes there that are unmistakable. Yeah, it was really good quality cask that Brian helped me source there for Great Northern. So, you know, it's testament to that. And, you know, if you have good spirit and good wood, you're going to get good whiskey. Pretty simple. Right? So, so tell us about the palate and the and the the, the 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 flavor here that we're getting. Talk us through this. Yeah, so I'll just take a little. Touch gone. You'll uh, I guess you, it's creamy and oily mouthfeel on it. Um, not overly what you know, it's not watery. Nice warming through it. Um. Mm. You see cereal kind of notes on it. The malted barley is coming through very evident. Um, oak tannins, lightly spiced, which is quite interesting on this, that the spiciness on it. Um, yeah, really for a, for a single malt. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Some, uh, it, was, it was common to me by a few people. Some people don't get it, but I, I, I definitely get the spiciness on it and kind of and a pot still in some... some absolutely, way. yeah. Yeah, there's a pot still note to it that I would have either attributed to pot still or to a high ABV, but it's not that high in ABV. It's 46%. So the heat is coming from somewhere else. Is it the Pedro Jimenez, perhaps, or the... Yeah, well, I'd say it's coming from the first fill bourbon that it was in. Mm. You know, and it's double. It's a double still single malt as well from, you know, so um, it's going to be a little more complex and a little more... Uh, characterful on the flavor profile than a triple distillation. You know, it's not going to be as, as to use the word smooth that people don't like to use, but that's a. I know. It is a technical term. So. It, it, there's a warmth to it that you wouldn't want to be too close to the fire. You might combust. There's a heat to it. You know, it's, it, there's a, a wonderful warmth to this that on a cold day, you could leave the fire off and just pour yourself a drop of this. Um, and yeah, I mean, six, 17 years is a long time in first fill bourbon, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is. Um, you know, obviously there's there was a lot of releases out there. You know, the Teeling range and the Tiraconnels, etc., that have, would would be the equivalents of it. So, and mm. um, it was a really nice single malt, I have to say, on its own. You absolutely could have released it the way it was, but I just it didn't. I wanted to have some part in hand in, in having some sort of influence on it. You know, even even as small as it was, but. Now I know these two these two whiskies have been very well received in Ireland. There's there's massive support for the independent uh, whiskey company in Ireland. I think there's a there's a groundswell, a kind of a grassroots support, which is great to see in Ireland. A lot of our audience here now are joining us from outside of Ireland. We've got Canada, United States, we've got Germany. You launched this originally initially in Ireland. So how would anybody else get hold of this? Is it available outside of Ireland? Are there plans for it to be available outside of Ireland or future batches? Yeah, so obviously they're small releases. So um, Irish market was always going to be first. Um, if you're going to make mistakes, make them local and make them small. Um, <laughs> so um, we're, we're planning. So at the moment, if somebody outside of Ireland wants to get, hang it, get hold of them, they're going to go through irishmalls.com. Um, they have stock in, they'll have more stock in their UK for their worldwide store uh, Tuesday. And, you know, you've got Celtic Whiskey and El Mulligans and James Fox. But in terms of retailers' presence, we haven't got a retail presence anywhere outside of a physical shop, shop for, uh, store anywhere outside of Ireland at the moment. We're working on one um, in the UK and a, chain, a small chain in the UK. And then we're working on a uh, small operation in the u.s at the moment which just re recently came about mm. but again it won't be the u.s it's going to be a very targeted state um that we hopefully can then maybe get a little more distribution to in some of the smaller states but uh, because the the cost of bringing over a small batch of whiskey is enormous isn't it the marketing of it the yeah. distribution yeah yeah we kind, we, we kind of need to get it nearly sold on pre-allocation that we want like that the the retailers and the market are demanding it so much that it's just going to be, you know, if they take in a mixed pallet or a full pallet or two pallets, that, that it will just, it'll already be sold before it ships, you know, that kind of way. I know, I know. Um, Steve asks if, if I like it, would I seek it out in the future? Um, I'm a huge single pot still fan and I'm, I'm very picky with my single malls. I'm, I tend to be, many single malls just don't sit the right way with me. Um, this one, there's a warmth to this and there's a finish to this. There's a sweetness to this that I absolutely love. Um, and I would absolutely seek it out again. Um, I'll have to seek it out again because I've got a full bottle here. So I'm going to seek it out on my shelf and, and finish the bottle. Um, but certainly I'm fascinated by independent companies who are trying, who are taking whiskeys from distilleries and finishing them their own way or putting their own spin on things or um, creating new paths of distribution or the smaller kind of more nimble, more kind of hustling individuals that start whiskey brands are fascinating to me. But of course the whiskey has to stack up behind it. And this, honestly, it's a beautiful whiskey. It's a stunning whiskey. Um, what's the retail price on this dahi? Uh, Kenty whiskey, Irish malts, most of them are 160. 160 euros. Right. Bar, yeah. We have them and most people have, most retailers have stuck to it. There's only a small amount of it left. Um, we held back a little for the UK market. Um, and we're doing a tweet tasting on on uh, uh, Wednesday night with Steve Rush Whiskey Wire. So that was the reason we held back a little of it. So right. hopefully it should be all gone soon enough, hopefully. So when, when you first came on the market in November, I remember the I remember seeing on Twitter the the uh, the refreshing tweets that were lauding the transparency. Uh, it wasn't somebody coming out saying I'm a distiller, here's my whiskey, uh, and, and you call yourself a distilling company. It was none of that. It was rather, no, I'm a whiskey merchant. I um, I buy from a distillery that I think makes good whiskey. I package it up, and I sell it. And I and here's my company, and here's my whiskeys. <laughs> and I think the uh, the transparency was was very well received early on. Um, many more have, have kind of followed in your footsteps since. Um, but it wasn't always that way in Ireland. So I think that's something that I know people are... Uh, enjoying understanding a little bit more where does the whiskey come from can they talk to the the founder of the company about it even if he didn't distill it himself so i think that's that's going to give you points brownie points in terms of uh, building up a bit of a loyalty too isn't it yeah it's it's it, it it was one of the you know key components of the business we were kind of 
building the brand, you know, what was our brand going to represent long term and and in the short term? And for me, uh, transparency where where it can where it can happen, then it should it should definitely be um, utilized. And the customers deserve that. The consumers deserve that. Your label is your contract. So if they can't pick up the bottle and you know trust what you're selling them, then don't buy it. That's my recommendation. Um, I won't hide behind that. Uh, I get, I know in some cases people can't do it, their NDAs, etc., and that's fair enough. But um, I think uh, consumer, you know, consumers are savvy now. We're not living in, you know, right. yeah. Everything is, everything should be transparent. You can search at the drop of a hat on on your phone or on your laptop anything you want to find out about anything or anyone. So. I think those days should be gone, and I, uh, I think Scotland is way ahead on that that front. But I think most people you see, my thoughts are that most people you see coming out now um, on the Irish scene, they're being very honest and upfront about things. And you've put your name on the bottle, so there's no hiding. Yeah, the Vanity Project. <laughs> <laughs> who, who is WD? Is that an ancestor? Is that a, a somebody in the family? I am actually WD. You're WD. I am, yeah. Christened William, yes. So, okay. But um, <laughs> I didn't initially plan and do. There's a story for putting that on there, actually. Uh, Go on. I was going to do WP, who was Bill Phil. The original Bill Phil was WP, mm. with Philip O'Connell. And um, basically, I was just look. There was something going to come up that might trip me up. I was going to put it just under Connell whiskey, and I needed to kind of. Uh, uh cement it cement my position on it so my name needed to be come to the fore for that so that's as much as i can tell you on that now i've realized okay that. <laughs> so uh yeah that's why i i I'll, I'll get into that another time with you maybe uh, in more detail so yeah i just felt that you know wp was a merchant store owner down in, in west limerick and um he was a blacksmith and a farmer and an engineer he was a very interesting guy uh, my great grandfather, and then my grandfather was, was equally interesting. And he, so basically, there was so many O'Connells around. Uh, he was known as the Bill Phil O'Connells, and his his son then was Jackie Bill Phil, who's my grandfather. And you know, we go down there. We're still the Bill Phils. You know, I, I grew up down there, learning to fish in the river field and messing around, bringing in a bit of turf. And and uh, they were famous for for. Uh, a tool for cutting turf called the Bill Finish Lawn. So uh, yeah. I was bringing out the peat of whiskey. I had no intention of doing anything with a name like that. Or, and then when I was bringing out the peat of whiskey, I decided that it uh, seemed like a perfect fit for it. And he was an interesting character. And the Bill Fills, a lot of them are interesting characters, the ones that are still around. So um, kind of nice to put it on there. Whether it'll always be just peated, I don't know. I kind of had plans for more, but maybe a pot still Bill Phil, but. Maybe we'll have to just park it as a piece of one and leave it at that. So you grew up in Limerick, did you? Or the family family from Limerick? Yeah, my dad was from Limerick, West Limerick, and all his family. And uh, I grew up in County Carlo, actually. So, um, And then I spent, uh, as soon as I did my leaving start, I was off down to Killarney for four years, and then on to Cork. And uh, yeah, the real capital, isn't that it? That's it. <laughs> They only bring people on who have a connection with Cork, tenuously or otherwise. <laughs> I, spent, I spent a good chunk of my life down in Cork, um, between between international stints as well, and uh, you know, really fond memories of being there. I only moved from Cork recently, actually. When I moved home, I, I went straight back to Cork. It felt like home. Um, well, we just moved to County Waterford there in uh, in October. And we discovered at Whiskey Live when I met you first that we had crossed paths uh, many years ago. We probably didn't meet each other, but back in 2003, 2004, I think it was, I had a stock taking company in Ireland. I would go around counting bottles and pubs and you were a part of a pub group in Cork. That was our client. And we would go around and count all the bottles every once a week, twice, uh, once every two weeks and do the inventory there. And you were part of that pub group and I never even knew it. Uh, I was a very small part. I was only a little a bottle washer. But, there uh, is. You did your bit. <laughs> it, yeah. so uh, yeah yeah that's gas it was gas that we had our paths across and i remembered your company then and i i'm pretty sure we did we did meet but mm. 
you would have been dealing with John McCarthy and another couple of guys more, more than Yeah, you. that's right. Yeah, I remember that. That was a long time ago. You were the biggest client we ever had at the time. And we were we were scared of our lives of this project because you had so, so many pubs. Like, th that many pubs wasn't normal. I can't remember how many it was. Was it eight or ten or something at the time? Or more? Oh, no, you had, I think they ended up having about 21 outlets. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Which is very unusual in Ireland for there to be a pub group that size. And, and we got the stock-taking contract for it. And we were afraid of our life of the size of this contract, how we were going to fulfill it and be able to count that many bottles. It was no joke. Yeah, yeah, well, those bottles need counting, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they tend to walk in Ireland. Um, oh, no. But yeah, and uh, you know, and just ask her, we just gave a bottle to our friend, it's grand, you know. That's it, he was thirsty. <laughs> and, and so you found, your, you found your way down to Waterford. Uh, so yourself and, and uh, your family are living in Waterford now. Yeah, we just moved to uh, outside Dungarvan, Strad Valley, just on the coast, so that we could just be a bit closer to my mum, who's back in, in Carlo still, and uh, getting close to uh, the, the motorway network is good, because we were down in West Cork, obviously, and it was a good hour and a half even to get to Cork City. So yeah. um, most of the distilling action is up around this part of the world now, and hopefully we can we can add to that now. With, not with a distillery. There are no plans for a distillery, by the way. Okay. Hopefully we get our maturation warehouse going and um, our own. Is, is that the plan to have your own bond, or is it, or or in yeah, time? We're working on it at the moment, yeah, yeah. So, so for those who don't know what a bond is, there are very few bonders in Ireland outside of the big distilleries who have their own warehousing and, and, and independent large uh, contract uh, uh, bonding companies that'll bond uh, for many companies, but there are very few smaller whiskey bottlers and and merchants that have their own bond, and a bond really is. It's a license. It's a it's a it's a promise to the government. You you put a lot of money. You put a lot of money in your pocket. Yeah. I realized the day that I uh, got my wholesalers license and I became a bonded tenant. So I, I'm a bonded tenant in a couple of warehouses. That I became a tax collector, essentially. That's it. That's uh, it. So not something I'm too fond of doing. But um, having lived in Hong Kong and Dubai over the years, paying tax wasn't uh, to the forefront of my uh, wish list. But um, here getting a bond here is is, is not an easy process um and uh essentially what you do is you get the you get the liquid in and the tax man has his his part of it he owns it the day it's from the day it's distilled and he wants his pound of flesh and you're responsible for keeping it for him to so become a bonded warehouse keeper is the actual technical term for it um and your your the duty is suspended while it sits in that location uh, where where it's under under bond essentially, and, so. and the tax isn't due until until it leaves the bonded warehouse. As soon as it leaves the bonded area of the warehouse, then the okay. tax is due on it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So so let's bring up the big hitter of the night, and I I have to say I I almost don't want to leave the seventeen year old behind because as it sits there now and it warms my belly. There's a lovely finish to that, I have to say. There's a warmth to that. that yeah, is it's, it's lovely and long, actually. We didn't get to that. Um, and there's a bit of chocolate in there, and the spices are there. Nice, light spices, and they just... There's a few different waves of it. So the, fin the finish is long. Like, it's it's definitely a, a single malt that, you know, is asking for... You're asking for more of that, you know. There's a taste of more off it, as they say. There's absolutely a taste of more. And that bottle's not going to last long, I'll tell you that. Now, I don't know whether I can say the same about the Peter whiskey, because that's great. <laughs> Your job is to tell me what I need to know about Peter whiskey. So um, here we are. We we're, we have a peated bottle in front of us. The first time I've ever shared a peated Irish whiskey on the live stream. I don't have a single peated Irish whiskey on my shelf. My wife, Mrs. Stories and Sips, is a massive peated whiskey drinker. She'll Lafroy, Connemara, big Scotch drinker, loves peated whiskies. She's going to devour this bottle as soon as it's opened. But me, I've never been able to get around it. So I'm officially in your hands now, which means you get to tell me what's right and what's wrong and what I, I need to know and what I shouldn't know about peated whiskey. So it's all yours. Yeah, there are far bigger peated experts out there than me, that's for sure. Um, I was like yourself, Barry. I wasn't a big peated fan at all. Uh, again, till I went to... Uh, Hong Kong, and even when I went, it was in Hong Kong, you know, there's a few of them out there, the the, the uh, Lefroig in particular, I couldn't, we sold a lot of it in the bar in Hong Kong, and I couldn't get over the smell of TCP from it. You remember TCP, yes. you graze your knee, and 
I know. I remember that. The brown bottle. And um, that's all I can get. That's all. I was like, how, why would anyone want to drink that? You know. Um, and it's amazing if you drop, take two little drops of water, a teaspoon of water, drop it into it, completely changes um, uh, the flavor profile and the nose on it, and it becomes very, very tasty. So these are a few tips and tricks that I got and uh, exposed me. I still wouldn't have a huge amount of, of <clears throat> uh, peated whiskeys in my on my shelf, but uh, I, I'm a big Sherry Bomb fan, so pot still fan, but. Uh, I'm definitely going to explore more of them now. Now that I'm peddling it as well, so uh, <laughs> yeah. I think Give us it, some background. Help us understand what peated whiskey is. It's not been part of. It has historically. It, it was more uh, widespread in Ireland. It hasn't been for the past, I don't know, fifty, sixty years. But help, help us understand for those who don't know what is peated whiskey. So it's the malt is peated um, when they they use turf or, or peat to dry it out, uh, essentially, rather than direct heat uh, that we would use traditionally in Ireland. And um, that imparts the smell uh, from of the peat onto the onto the malt uh, and um, malted barley. So when you obviously distill with it, you get the, the phenols are quite high, the PPMs there. You might hear reference to PPM parts per million, that's phenols parts per million. And uh, that's the smoky smell that, that you get um, so you've got huge peat monsters. Uh, you've got a great whiskey called the peat monster, actually. Um, and you've got some some big, big, heavy hitting peats in Scotland. Um, so they're all double distilled mainly. You know, Connemara was the only other one we had in Ireland. Um, and then Great Northern started up, I don't know, four and a half years ago, maybe four years ago. Um, Alan Anderson was there and he was a distiller at the time, and he convinced him to do some uh, triple distilled peat of malt. And uh, I don't think they did huge amounts of it. Um, they put it into, you know, Alan, the stuff in Great Northern that he distilled, you know, you, you've tasted a lot of it. There's a lot of it out there in the market. It's really, really high quality stuff. And the peat uh, triple malt was no different. And when he, he got some his hands in some excellent, excellent casks, I can't say where they're from, but I do know where they're from. And uh, re it's a really good recipe. So I think what you'll see when you when you get this on the nose is quite a powerful nose on it, but not that solvent TCP style that you're getting. And um, you want to take a nose of it. So 47.5% 40, alcohol. Yeah, it's quite a high ABV. Um, I'm going to hold this up real quick so people can see the uh, see the bottle. Love, do you want a glass? Do you want a drop of this? Yeah, uh, give Mrs. Stories and Sips a drop. She's the expert. Mrs. Stories and Sips is going to get her glass because <laughs> she, uh, she is going to be a far better uh, judge and uh, <laughs> evaluate yeah. her this than I am. So just for anyone who's into peat or whatever, just the knowledge and basis that it was when it was still started out distillation about 50 parts per million phenols, and then it would have come down to the low teens on the third distillation, so maybe 12 or 13, and then as it's maturing, it's going to go back up a little. Um, that's what we're seeing so far, and uh, it's probably at about 14 and a half, 15 million ppms at the moment. And what's so, the highest ppm of, of, of whiskeys typically? What does it go up to? I have no idea. No idea. Um, could so be, uh, 14 would be considered low, low enough? Recently, I, I was, was massively high, I think. Yeah. Maybe so, 80, maybe 300 ppms that I hear. Okay. But I don't think the palate can tell the difference, you know, from... It's a bit like download speed, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you, you only know it if it's not there. Here you go, love. There's a glass for you. All right, so Mrs. Stories and Sips putting her nose to it as well. Yeah, so you're getting... Like, you tell me what you're getting on it. I'm getting um, somewhere between TCP and a bonfire. You're getting, you're not getting TCP. That's now, I plant no. that seed in your head. I'm getting, I'm getting um, a pink knee after grazing it on the ground uh, while running at seven years old in Cove. Yeah. I think, Barry, we have to go back to, what, what was the, 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 the first piece of whiskey you ever drank? The only I knew, I, I knew I'd frustrate you. I knew I'd break you with my... Uh, um, Did you ever drink it? Did you ever drink a piece of whiskey though? Is it a bit like uh, you have tequila? 
And uh, oh, Connemara would be the only whiskey, the peated whiskey. I, I stayed away from scotches, so Connemara would be the closest. And you didn't like it, yeah. That's a double distilled malt too. Would be be a bit more, bit heavier. I think might mightn't smell as heavy. So, like on that nose, obviously there's a smoky, there's a smoky nose on it, um, but there's pear, archer fruit fragrances. Are you getting any of those? Mrs. Stories and Sips is laughing. She's she's loving it so much. She's her head is thrown back in laughter. She's so enjoying herself over there. What Mrs. Stories and Sips get on the nose. What do you get on the nose? Overwhelming smoke. Overwhelming smoke. In a good way. In a good way. Okay, good. The difference on this now is when you're on, on the nose, as I said to you, it is, it's quite intense on the nose. It's, it's pronounced. But when you get it onto the palate, you're, gonna, you're going to notice that it's completely different. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give you a really nice creamy mouthfeel, very creamy mouthfeel. That's the high ABV is going to help with that too. And that's one of the reasons that we would have selected that, that ABV to give you that mouthfeel. Okay. Because the, the, the lower you bring down the ABV, the water, the more watery, warming feel you get, as opposed to the smooth, mouth, creamy mouth feel. So this is 40, 14 parts per million. Roughly, yeah. And Whiskey Cast has chimed in, thanks, uh, Mark. It says 300 ppms or more of phenols, but mostly they usually max out at 75 to 100 tops. So this would be a lighter peated whiskey by every metric. So you should be getting some poached pears, the cereals coming through, sweet. Again, you're getting that. The phenols are there, but there's a lot more happening. The I'm ash of a fire. I'm, I'm the, the, yeah. the, the, ember, the embers the morning after. Yeah, light ash at the end, yeah, and the finish. Really. So how, how do I get beyond that? Like, how do I get beyond the smoke and the and those, that, that peated, I, I, my amateur palate, is struggling to separate that smoke from maybe how I've been conditioned through a, I think a, a grain or a pot. You have to forage on and drink more peat. Uh, peat is peat. <laughs> you, know, you remember, you drink stout. You're a stout drinker, yeah? Good pint of Guinness, won't turn it down? Yeah, so remember your first pint of Guinness. Would you Couldn't be, Yeah. That yeah. burnt flavor. You probably went back and had a pint of Murphy's because it's nice and sweet. The toasted, the toasted malt now would be different than uh, than this. Uh, so the Guinness is a bit of an acquired taste too as you get older. So maybe you just have to, you've yet to mature a little, you know, your palate is probably lacking a bit of. So the man who makes, the man who sells peated whiskey suggests I should drink more peated whiskey. Absolutely. I, I, okay, this is very objective, Absolutely. independent. Yeah, give it a bit of time. You'll get those, as I said, the archer fruits and the sweetness coming through. Mm. Uh, like, some people will tell you lemon curd, and it's like hmm. David Mara actually give him a name check there. He'd get, yeah, he'd get David, great guy. lemon curd on it. Is that right? Yeah. There is a there's a warmth as well to this, very similar to the um, the seventeen year old. There's a an overwhelming warmth to the to the on the palate that is not present and not as familiar to me from drinking pot stills. A heat yeah. that is that is lit up inside my mouth. Yeah, and peated whiskey will give you length as well. So even if you were to make a blend, for example, and you wanted to get a bit of length from a blend, you could drop in a per, one or two percent of, of that blend to be peated whiskey. Should we drop in a, a drop of water into this? Everyone's suggesting I should drop in some water. I, I, I would keep it to the minimum. Um, I'll drop in. Yeah, the ABVs I have selected are selected for drinking without water. So that's okay, three, three drips. So it, it'll open it up a small bit. I'll just drop in a little bit. Yeah. Just to... Richard wonders if it's like licking an ashtray or a barroom floor. No, it's not, not It's not in any way as negative as that, Richard. Oh, it's, um, <laughs> and I've not licked an ashtray or a barroom floor, so I have nothing to compare it to. Mm. Opens it up a bit. The spices are still there. You lose wow. a bit of the oiliness. Hmm. Yeah, it's um now with a drop of water, the, the the peat is taking a little step back. 
and I'm maybe seeing little flavors poking through that I wouldn't have found on the first sip. But I, I wonder if you're right. I wonder if I just have to keep drinking it. I remember the first time I tried red breast, I, I didn't take to it at all. I, it was too complex, too spicy. It took years for me to come around and suddenly realize, oh wow, this is actually a fantastic whiskey. Yeah, I, I honestly do. I, I, I'm not just, I'm not just trying to wind you up. I think that, that's how I, you know, I, I, I thought Peter was, was awful. That's my honest opinion. You know, and uh, this mm. is a really, really. I knew when I knew when I tasted the cask first when it was ver like before it was even three, that it was going to be special. I didn't know how quickly though. And the thing with peated whiskies, you can get you can get away with youth. So you, that whiskey you're drinking is three years and ten months old when it's bottled, um, and it's being compared to on a regular basis, not by me, by random punters, um, to and you know our big ten and some of the other good islands. There's no way I would have ever told you that was a three year and something whiskey. So the yeah. is the peat or what is what is. Uh, Balancing the distillate, the the obvious distillate forwardness of a three-year-old whiskey, almost four. Well, God, I don't. Do you know what? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not even going to try and bluff that one. I just know that young peated whiskies um, ten ten. I, I guess the peat in it, the phenols in it, are just giving you a whole other level of and layering of flavor profile. That's allowing allowing you to explore the rest of the flavors. Um, and maybe masking a bit of that ethanol that would normally be there, that, that, yeah. spirit, that spirit that would come to the fore. Um, again, the cask selection here was, I think, really, uh, really crucial. Not by me, I mean the cask selection by the distiller at the time when he filled them. So really, really helps um, that it's that that done by somebody else, you know. <laughs> yeah. Queen wants to know, um, he, so he, he was converted to Pete a few months back through Bill Phil. Uh, suggestions from where to go next. Where would you go up from from a, a Bill Phil if you were sticking to uh, Peter whiskies? Would you have any idea on that? Yeah, like I guess you could you could try you could try some of the Optimores or which are going to be quite expensive though and um, hard to find. Some of the the R bags and things from Isle really is going to be good. Brook Laddie, Mark Rainier's old place, Mark from Waterford. Um, there, there's there's a lot. There's, a, there's so much Scotch whiskey out there. Obviously, not, it's not all peated, but there's a lot of a lot of really good peated whiskeys there. Uh, our bag ten is, as I said, if he wanted to compare the our bag ten, would we want to start with maybe and see what he thinks himself? That's that's, that's what other guys are comparing it to. So, it, it it's absolutely growing on me. I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't. It's it's not something that I'm going to push away and say I hate it. It's one of those things where I'm not familiar with it, and it, these are unusual and unfamiliar notes on the on the palate. Yeah, if you had a taste of the single cask, uh, the first one was a single cask release that that came out. That was that was sold out. There might be a couple of bottles knocking around at a couple of smaller stores in Ireland. But all the online stores are gone, and um, it, it was like it was really it was really super. And uh, this then to see it come on. Five months later, the balance has come to it already. So it'll be interesting to see where the sweet spot is with it. And then obviously we can do some playing around with cherry cask as well with things like that. So so this is all bourbon, uh, ex-bourbon barrels? Yeah, ex-bourbon. 100% bourbon. bourbon. So the plan is to keep aging. So you'll in time have a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, or what's the plan with well, the yeah, I want to, I'll, I'll, yeah, the plan is to get replenished stocks as often as we can. We still have some of the original stock left, so you'll see. So you've seen a three-year, five months. You've seen a three-year, ten. Later, later this year, you'll see it over four. You'll see the progression of it, and then eventually we'll stop doing these. We'll stop doing. So this was a batch because it was a, it was a two casks that we put together. First one was a single cask. This was a batch. This was two casks. And okay. You'll see the progression of it, and the plan is to get it so that we have it standardized as much as we can. Bill fill non-age statement. So where that sweet spot is, whether it's three years, ten months, months or four and a half years or five years, we've yet to discover. Um, and then obviously there should be age statement stuff, you know, way down the line. Online. So there would be a continuous available lineup, and then perhaps some special releases of age statements and things like that eventually. 
I hope so. Yeah, if we can, if we can, uh, if we can weather the storm and and you know get some longevity about us. Jeff wants to know what's the peat source of the bill field. Do you know? Yeah, it's Scottish. Uh, it's Scottish peat and all, so it comes from Montrose, Scotland. Montrose, Montrose Scotland. Uh, and I know from a Twitter exchange that happened uh, this week, there are a few molsters in Ireland that are now um, that are now. Uh, producing malt, uh, peat. They're using peat to dry the malt uh, and floor malting uh, using using peat, uh, which a few years ago we didn't have. Yeah, I only learned I only learned that myself this week as well. Um, obviously, I'm not trying to distill anything at the moment, so I wasn't really looking. But we would love to get some small distillations done with some Irish malted barley, uh, peated barley, whatever it is. Brendan Carty up in Cologne, he's 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 peating his own. His own um, malted barley too. So, um, it's good to see the development. I mean, again, three four years ago, we didn't see any of these uh, innovations. Anything from PX to there wasn't a there wasn't a peated whiskey on the market four years. Well, apart from Connemara, was the only one, uh, the only brand that, that would have been out there four three four years ago. And now we've got Glen Gareth. Yeah. Well, they're not peated malt, but rather a kind of a peated charred barrel. Um, yeah, so it's a reused uh, reused mm -hmm. peated barrel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, we've got Hinch have brought out um, That's right. and something, you know, I, I have no doubt you're going to see a pot still with peat influence in it um, in the not too distant future. Um, not who me, would, uh, who just, bring that out? Is it you? No, no, it's not. I don't have the, the ability to do that at the moment, but um, I think that's going to that's going to happen, no doubt. Um, Pete will become more apparent. I think some of the larger operation. I know. I know for a fact some of them are bringing out Pete and whiskey later this year. Um, they might have delayed it a little bit with, with what's happening, but you, you're going to see a lot more of it. Um, you know, if we're going to if we're going to take on Scotch really as a you know as as a sector, and we're going to be a serious challenger, we have to develop Pete and whiskey. Because There's no reason why we shouldn't, is there? No. Well, we you know. We have an English man in Mark Rainier telling the world that he heard from a Scotsman in Brook Laddie when he started that the best grain and malt in the world came from the southeast of Ireland, and that's why he's here now. So if that's the case, we need to start getting all our farmers growing it and diversifying, maybe maybe less of the cattle, and uh, <laughs> you know, get them back into tillage where possible in the good land, you know, East Cork and upwards, obviously, and. Uh, over towards the east coast and southeast, and start using Irish malt, uh, Irish barley, and it'll be more interesting. I think the flavor profiles are different. I've been in, I've been to visit Ned down in Waterford, and you know you, you can you can see the difference in it. Uh, you can Kalak vodka. Uh, only tasted that today actually, and um, not that I sit around drinking vodka every day. Uh, I was doing it. Your life, you do what you want. And it's made from it's made from Irish barley, That's right. and uh, malted barley, and the flavour out of it is like no other vodka I've ever tasted. And, I, vodka, I said, and vodka is just the most you know it's pretty boring. Right. I drank a lot of different styles of vodka over the years in the bar trade, just trying them out and cocktails and that. And this this blew my mind at what the flavour profiles they were getting, and obviously we're using pot still as well, pot stills to distill it, but. I love, the, I love the focus on Irish barley lately. Kalak is a great, Kalak vodka is a great example. The whole, actually, all the range of gins and vodkas and whiskies that come out of that, that, that come out of that camp are all barley, Irish barley origin. Waterford Distillery, obviously, doing really interesting things. I spent an hour yesterday talking with uh, with Grace O'Reilly, the agronomist, Ireland's only distillery employed agronomist, whose job is to work with the farmers on soil management and yield and quality from the from the grain and the barley. And you have to be inspired and amazed by what's happening down there in the southeast. You're not too far away from the distillery yourself, but the focus on barley is going to change how people think about the ingredients in their whiskey going forward. In my opinion, absolutely. Um, you know, you use good ingredients. It's like anything: good ingredients, good distillate, good casks. It's it's, it's not rocket science, you know. It's and that's good why ingredients you in good whiskey out. Yeah, it's it's it's, pre it's pretty simple in theory, anyway. So uh, I think um, it's going to be really it's really exciting to see it, and, and lots of people doing really exciting things. So 
there will be more petered. Part of that, and hopefully we're going to, you know, we're building alliances with people. And the whole idea is is to get as much whiskey as you can from as much of the smaller guys as possible, so that we can we can kind of play around with what they're what they're producing and Willy Wonka style whiskey factory. So um, let me know in the comments anybody who's got any questions for uh, for Dahi uh, as we're sipping away on this uh, peated whiskey. As you'll have noticed, as I listen to Dahi. I keep coming back to it. I'm sipping it. I'm on a journey of whiskey. I say this every time any more than two people are gathered around me. I'm no expert on whiskey. I'm an amateur who is on a journey kind of learning about whiskey like the rest of us. And I'm fascinated when people can point out things to me that I didn't know before. And I keep coming back to it now and trying to identify, okay, where's that pear that Dahi talked about? Where is it? Is it hiding there behind the drop of smoke? But um, I'm coming back to it and I'm not disliking it. And I, I to me, it's it, in my head now, I've got this emotional image of the campfire whiskey i'm standing around the campfire drinking this and maybe that's my mm -hmm. bridge into mainstream drinking is okay there's a i have a moment for it in my mind yeah into a flask and uh out, out for your hill walk someday obviously not down in san diego as you're in now wouldn't be maybe well, it gets cold enough there i did a race there a lot, number of years ago it was quite cold. That cold. <laughs> and uh but get a get a hip flask there and put a drop of tea into it and mix it in with um Drop of black tea, bit of peas of whiskey. Good right. little, good little caffeine generator there, and it'll kicker for you. We'll, Get report, you we'll uh, report back on that. Having a bit of peas of whiskey, you go fantastic with some cheese, chocolates. Uh, oh. you know, some of the nuttier cheeses, like Comte or something like that. Uh, that. Right. Uh, go down really well. So lots can be done. Yeah. We've done fantastic uh, Irish coffee. Really nice, really yeah. nice. Um, and some some interesting cocktails that we'll be releasing, kind of recipes from with some with some of the good bartenders around Ireland, professional bartenders who would uh, have been messing around with Bill Phil to see what they can come up with. So, we yeah, Mark of, says, Mark, who is, uh, is on YouTube, Mark Bergen, a good buddy of ours, Bill Phil and Hinch Peter were his two standout whiskeys from Whiskey Live in Dublin. Um, Nick Ryan himself, uh, a, a whiskey uh, whiskey merchant himself, says the Nordics and the Germans love the peat, uh, which is which is true. Um, Ishka Baha on YouTube says Dunville has the three crowns peated. Uh, so yeah, Dun um, Eklundville Distillery coming out with their peated whiskies as well, um, which is great yeah. to see that more and more. It's amazing how much I've actually tasted that. It's amazing how much of the peat influence comes across. That's a cask finish, like like. Like a PX finish or whatever, but using a heated cask and it's really interesting. Um, that uh, are you getting any of those new flavors now? It really opens up after a little while. Honestly, I have to say I'm not. I'm, I'm looking for them and I'm not there yet. So I, it's still to me, it's smoky. I'd be lying to say, oh yeah, they're they're leaping out at me. Um, That's this okay. is going to be one of those different. Yeah, like different times of the day, I get different things from the whiskey. So this is my excuse to crack open the breakfast whiskey now. So Bill yeah. Phil will have to be uh, the breakfast whiskey tomorrow. Like. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Mrs. Stories and Sips has uh, almost finished her glass over there. So that's that's good. Uh, yeah, that's a good sign there. Yeah, does she like it? She does, yeah. Yeah, she's she's grinning from ear to ear, sipping on it. Um, yeah, well, like if anyone who's, who likes Pete loves this, it's it's really good, you know, and uh, a few people have been converted. A lot of few of them here have been on tonight. I've seen them pop up and out there um, with some comments. And I think, it, it, but I, I go back to that thing. You have to educate your palate, whether it's wine, whether it's yeah. Yeah. cheeses, whether it's whiskey. It doesn't make a difference. You have to educate it. And if you, if you, you have to open it up. And I think if you keep going back and trying things, you, 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 you'll find more. Well, if you insist, I'll do my best. I'll do my best on it. Yeah, we've got a nice bit, bit of a bottle there to, to help you with it. So I mean, there's I've got at least a week's worth of it here to keep me going. So I'll work my way through it. Um, Maureen on Facebook says she recommends putting a couple of drops on freshly shot oysters. Now, there's a recipe. Yeah. Now, you, you can convince me to eat oysters if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I douse them in Bill Phil, I might. That'd be some night out we'd have with uh, oysters and Bill Phil. That'd be a great, yeah, good combination yeah, there. Sure, sure, it would go down well. I just couldn't. So oysters, I just could never get my uh, my head around at all. 
Cassandra reckons this would make a killer smoked old fashioned. I'm definitely willing to try that. I'm a big fan of the old fashions. I have yeah, I'm an old fashioned man myself, and uh, a lot of the smoked old fashions are actually not made of peated whiskey at all. They they right. just smoke the glass. They smoke it after some sort of diffuser or infuser or whatever. So With I think why yeah. not use an actual peated whiskey or smoky whiskey to to make it be more interesting? Barry Murphy asks. Um, is there a cat swing version of the X on the horizon? There, there, it, yeah, I mentioned that at the start there. It's in the works. Um, we're just trying to, we're trying to see how we're going to release it and where we're going to release it and what bottle size we're going to release and what we're working on at the moment, but it might be too far away. So what's the next thing to come out of uh, WD O'Connell Whiskey Merchants that you can tell us, that you can share with us? Uh, well, there, there'll be more, there'll be more bill fill at some stage, uh, okay. later this year, because, uh, you know, there's only 600 bottles there and they're selling quite strong. So most of them are on shelves. Um, so I guess at some point later in the year that will happen. I was hoping to do a bit of a pot still, but I'm probably going to hold back for another bit. Okay. Uh, not this year, maybe 2021. And, um, you might have sampled that actually. That was, it's, it's Really interesting. Um, the PX series might might get the non age statement PX series, but I don't know. To be on, to, honestly, I can tell you there'll be more bill fill and there'll be PX eighteen. That's okay. guaranteed. Whether something else pops up in the meantime or not, uh, we'll see. I think we just have to kind of sit back now and watch how things are going to pan out. And you know, we yeah. can't be overstretching ourselves or trying to flood the market. You know, we're conscious of that too. We're a very small brand. We want to grow organically, and we don't we, we don't be flooding the marketplace with with lots of releases. Um, if the other ones aren't gone, you know, we want the demand to be there, and we want to see. You know, everyone's our guinea pigs. All these people are buying our whiskey. So if they buy it and it sells quickly, and we get all positive feedback, we'll make more of it. That seems like good customer research there and good uh, market research. Uh, there's a ton of people in the comments uh, asking about when Irish malts will get restocked. It looks like Irish malts are out of bill fill. I think Celtic Whiskey Shop might have some. I checked, was it yesterday? I thought they had some on stock. But um, yeah, Irish, Irish malts, I was talking to John from Irish malts. Celtic Whiskey are in stock and so are uh, El Mulligans, as far as I know. Okay. Um, Irish malts are in stock in Ireland and they'll have stock in their worldwide stores. So if you're outside of Ireland, they'll have stock again on Tuesday. Okay, so yeah. stock again on Tuesday. So I see a lot of you are looking, you want to buy this whiskey, you want this peated whiskey. So check back with Irish malls. That they have two different stores. Depending on where you log in from, it gives you what's available in your location, I think. So their worldwide yeah. store will be restocked on Tuesday. Uh, Dahi, is that it? Yeah, and we're doing a tweet taste on Wednesday. Yeah, because we're doing a tweet taste on Wednesday night with a UK focus with with uh, the Whiskey Wire, you know, and uh, Steve Rush. And so we need to stock over there uh, for, for, for those punters. And um, we're also launching our own e-commerce store on our own site. So okay, there will be some releases that might be just our own done, small releases, single castings like that, that we'll just do through our own site as well. What is the difference between the two batches? And I presume that does that refer to so Tom O'Regan asks that maybe that refers to th these are both you had a batch zero almost, didn't you? At a whiskey live, no, I had a single, I had a single cask bill filled, so okay, yeah, so this it was just single cask, you know, that was that was it, so it does exactly what it says in the tin. So this was a batch because it was two casks or more married together to create it, so we started off at batch zero one. And the PX will remain as batch zero one because it was a batch created and then divided up into several other casks. So uh, you get to kind of come on that journey as well. We probably won't do cat batches forever, batch numbers. We're kind of we we we'll, we we'll, for for age statement stuff and that and single cask it'll just be that. But you know we won't be doing batch two hundred or anything like that. You know. Okay. We've got some Irish retailers in the comments who are waving their hands furiously to make sure that we know that they stock. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So John Fleming down in Carryout in Killarney, of course. And you've got Ked Murphy down in 69 Kinsale and Pat Keller and Nina. And uh, Keller's and Nina. And you've got number 21 off licenses all over Munster. Um, did I leave anyone else out? James Fox's 
They'll wave their hand if you left them out. Don't you worry. We only, we only have eight or nine uh, accounts that sell at the moment, and that's that's purposely. It's not. We don't have a lot, and they're all they're all well recognised whiskey stores. Um, and then you get it in Galway as well as the Cambridges. I think it's called, isn't it? Um, the Cambridges. Yeah. Are you finding this behind the bar anywhere? Like, are, are bars serving this up in cocktails in many places? Yeah, I, I I don't know, but the cocktails they're serving it are like it's in it's. The chalk group had just taken it as far as they know. Mark might confirm if it's in a few of the outlets, but obviously they shut just as it was getting so settled, sorted out. And okay. we, I had done a few days in Galway myself, and it was it was in a few of the bars in Galway. And um, so we have a national wholesaler now for the on trade as well. Um, so access to the bars wasn't focused on really. It was it was for the retail. We felt it was retail ready, branding wise, and limited stock quantity and price point but as it grows we're gonna we're gonna focus more on the on trade so it is in it is in several like you know dick max and shelburne have it and like i don't i don't want to name check everyone because I, I, I know who, i know we'll be here all day who doesn't even have it who does have it i don't know because we don't sell direct to them and um, they're buying it from third parties so uh, but it, it's in a lot of a lot of the good bars up in dublin as well it's in Bose and uh, okay a few places the dame so pa Barton Jones uh, mentions on Facebook that this Bill Phil may be his summer Pete. He typically leaves Isla in the spring, uh, so he's moving on to, to Bill Phil for his, for his summer Pete. That's good. Good, uh, good to hear. Well, let us know how you get on with that, Barton. Because uh, and and everybody, please, anytime you want to reach out, if you have any questions or you want to find out something or you want to track something down or a bottle, uh, you know we're only at the other end of of one of the social medias or emails and. And I'll always get What's the website, Gahi, if people want to find out more? Yeah, wdoconnell.com. And uh, then you can get us across all the social media platforms using at O'Connell Whiskey. At O'Connell Whiskey. So wdoconnell.com. Yeah, yeah. um, yeah. Well, I will say that um, I am more, I am closer to enjoying peated whiskey than I was an hour and uh, 12 minutes ago. Um, I'm not there yet. You've brought me closer. I do think this has a place in my life. I need to find that place. I need to carve out the space. And again, like I'm on a journey and I'm letting experts and those who know more tell me uh, um, what I should be looking out for. So this has been super helpful to me and to my nose. Yeah, good. Well, look, it's, as I said, I didn't think I was going to convince you. Uh, you either like it or you don't. That's, that's what I tell people. You either like it or you don't. There's not... There's not one hard and fast rule when it comes to whiskey, but I do no. believe I did. Maybe Bill Phil mightn't be the Peter whiskey for you, but I think there will be one you'll find that you will like. You know, this will not be thrown out. This will be enjoyed. Mrs. Stories and Sips might finish more than half the bottle before I get to it, but um, I, I definitely see a place for this, and I'm I would love to be standing around a fire with this and smelling the fire and smelling the whiskey at the same time. To me, that. Again, I'm, I'm new to this. I'm new to the Peter whiskey, but that seems to be a great place for this in my life right now. Until maybe it's more of a daily drinker, perhaps. If it ever yeah, gets there. Right. My, uh, there's a lot of guys have it as daily drinkers already, which I was quite surprised by. I have to say, and, and delighted to hear, of course. Um, but my cousin, my cousin, my second cousin over in Sydney, Joe Lines, he I sent him over a bottle and uh, a bottle of each because he was very good to me when I was younger in Australia. Always gave me a place to stay and a few beers and a few sauces okay. the barbecue okay. and uh he's a, he's a sydney man and his family were from west limerick as well mount collins and uh he sent me a message he cracked open the bill fill night and he sent me a message saying brought him straight back to mount collins as a, as a kid you know so is that right yeah it's nice to hear that you know and we had a big connect a lot of people connected with us a lot of family you know distant family connected with me that you know, Bill Phil was related to them as well, obviously from from other siblings and that that I wouldn't know all over the states and is that right? And Ireland and yeah, yeah, people have never met, so it's really interesting. We'd have to try to do a Bill Phil Hooley sometime, bit of a get a Kaylee going or something. Yeah, yeah, how about that? <laughs> well, listen, um, Di, I'm very appreciative of, of, of you joining us. Um, thanks a million for coming on and bringing your two great whiskeys. I'm delighted to. Uh, bring these to more of a wider audience. Hopefully those in America who want their hands on these will go to Celtic Whiskey Shop, El Mulligan's, uh, Irish Malts, and find these, uh, especially when they're restocked. Um, I'm delighted to 
get somebody to talk me through peated whiskey. I hope that um, that demand grows. I'm excited to see what happens next. I'm excited to see the 18 year old, maybe at Whiskey Live, we might see an 18 year old in November if it goes ahead. I hope you'll see it before then. Oh, very good, great stuff. Yeah. Um, well, well, listen, yeah, thanks for having me on. Like, you know, absolutely. I think we it's all great. appreciate the efforts you're going to, to help us. Uh, you know, you're, you, you know, you're not just a Middleton man, like, you know, you're, you're showing your, you're, you're there for all the small guys as well. And it's really much appreciated. That's no, sure. listen, I, I'm a big, of course, I'm a big fan of Middleton and they've an amazing Ooh, spirit. My, Middleton, room is, my room is full of it upstairs. I will listen. Look at, look at the room behind me. Sure. Look, there's red breasts on every shelf, but they have a much bigger budget than you do. So I want to make sure that you get a shout out as well. Uh, and all the other smaller businesses do as well. Uh, so we'll be showcasing more whiskey merchants, whiskey bonders and bottlers and companies over the coming weeks and having them on here. So will you come back to us when you have an 18 year old and talk to us about that? I will. And I'll let you know, hopefully we're working on a US based release. So we'll let you okay. know. We'll let okay. you break that one scene as you are. Irish Fantastic. American. That's me. Yeah, that's it. The gateway to Irish whiskey fans in America right here. Jahi, I'm going to let you go. Going away to bed. Uh, it's late in Ireland. Thanks a million for joining us. And um, I'm going to stay on here. I'm going to drink some more whiskeys. We're moving on to Powers John's Lane in a second. But I do believe that Mrs. Stories and Sips has locked herself out of the house. I've got to go open the front door and I'll be back in a second. So everyone stay tuned. Jahi, thanks a million. Uh, I'll Aren't be back in a second as well. All right, I'm back. <laughs> herself locked her. She locked herself out of the house. <laughs> did you lock yourself out? How did you do that? You brought the key with you. She brought the wrong key with her. She locked herself out. All I heard was a gentle little tapping on the door. She was afraid to knock too loud. She knew I was doing the live stream. <laughs> Sit down there and have your uh, your peated whiskey and enjoy yourself. All right, we're going to move on to. Uh, let me see. We're going to move on to Powers John's Lane. <laughs> right, so we're still here. We're drinking whiskey. We are not finished yet. This is a lock-in. Uh, it was a lock-out a second ago. <laughs> Miss the stories and Sips got locked out. <laughs> right, she's back in. Good news. And she's got her whiskey in her hand. So we can, we can keep going. That's the good news. Um, so thanks, everybody, for sticking around. We're going to move on to the next whiskey that we have, which is Powers John's Lane Release, which is a 12-year-old single pot still from Middleton and County Cork and is an homage and homage to the John's Lane distillery, the, the ancestral home, of course, of Powers uh, Irish Whiskey uh, in Dublin, uh, uh, which it closed in the early 1970s as all production shifted to Middleton and County Cork. So I've got a lovely, I've got my Sonny Malloy's Red Breast glass here, which I love holding this rocks glass for a nice drop of whiskey. Um, let me see. Maureen reckons that you were you were running out to hide the whiskey. Is that what you were doing? <laughs> I went out for a quick smoke break. <laughs> JJ says very brave on the peat taste. You know, JJ, I, honestly, now I appreciate it for what it was. I'm not there yet. I'm on the way, uh, but it's definitely uh, of interest to me. So I'm going to get to know it a bit more, isn't it? What a, a massive world out there of whiskies that we have yet to enjoy. <laughs> Uh, that we haven't tried or tasted. So I couldn't dismiss it out of hand without um, at least trying to get to understand it. So I'm open to understanding as much as I can about whiskeys on this journey that I'm on to try and educate this amateur palate that I have. All right, so Jeff has rinsed his glasses and he's moving on to John's Lane. Jeff, I would have thought you'd have had a glass for every bottle uh, in that fantastic bar of yours that I see when you're on, your, when you're on our tastings. Um, surely you don't have to rinse the same glass out Jonathan says, finally, he has something that I'm drinking. He loves this whiskey. Um, yes, Powers John's Lane is an incredible drop of whiskey. So last night, we hosted a Powers virtual Irish whiskey tasting. We had all three whiskeys that are in their permanent lineup. Powers John's Lane, Powers Three Swallow Release, and Powers Gold Label. Two pots still whiskeys and a blend. And we led 120 Ohioans through these great whiskies and shared the stories of James Power and John Power and the incredible deeds that they did uh, over the years and the incredible brand that they built. That was, of course, one of Ireland's best-selling whiskies, Powers Gold Label, for many years, certainly when I was growing up. 
um, which was a, a great time. Um, and I know a few of you who are on here tonight were at the tasting last night. So it's good to see you again. Uh, everyone who was at our tasting got a great gift from the Powers team in Ohio. They got a $30 rebate, a $30 um, yeah, rebate off a bottle, which brings a bottle of Powers John's Lane down to about $25, $30, or a bottle of Powers Gold Label down to 3 or $4, which is a, a great a great price altogether. Um, Patrick Call uh, says he's got a bottle of Three Swallows in front of him. Great value. Fantastic. The Powers range now, I have to say, is beautiful. My only complaint with the Powers range currently is that its range is limited, that there's only three whiskies in what is honestly an iconic Irish whiskey brand and something that we should see a lot more of. And who knows, maybe we will with the refresh and the rebrand. Julie says that she's got John's Lane in the jar. Great stuff. Let me see who else has got there. Uh, Brian Redden bought his uh, three swallows today. Good man, Brian. William, good man, William in Nevada. John's Lane is one of his daily sippers. It is an absolutely incredible whiskey, this uh, Powers John's Lane. So it's been out now about, ooh, I believe, about six years. It's been, maybe is it that long? Maybe six years in the market. Um, a 12-year-old whiskey, single pot still, aged in a combination of ex-bourbon barrels and ex-Oloroso sherry barrels. Uh, fantastically balanced whiskey. The only Powers in the range with an age statement on it, 12 years old. So again, for those of you who are unfamiliar with age statements whenever you see the age of a bottle like here it says age 12 years not to be confused with proper 12 which is not age 12 years at all it is aged uh, a little bit less than that uh, but this is aged for 12 years minimum there could be older whiskies in this by law we can't declare whether if there are older whiskies we can only declare the youngest whiskey in there so 12 year old whiskey this is a um a release that was uh designed to Highlight, celebrate, showcase, acknowledge the incredible contribution the John's Lane Distillery in the Liberties in Dublin made to Irish whiskey, to Ireland, uh, and to uh, yeah, to Irish whiskey um, culture, and just Irish culture generally over uh, about 180 years of distilling in John's Lane in Dublin, which is an incredible, incredible history. I am absolutely fascinated by the Powers brand. Uh, I love the history. I love the story. I can't get enough of it. And I know there's controversy over the rebranding and the reshaping of the bottles. Um, but I was delighted to learn a little bit more about the rebrand and the new bottles recently. And I, I saw a great picture. I wonder if I can pull it up for you and maybe share it with you. I'm not sure how to do screen shares, but I'll figure it out here. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. So I'm going to pull up uh, a picture, which I think will be helpful to share with you. So Powers recently um, rebranded their bottles. Name, let me see what I can find here. I'm going to find my presentation I did for the tasting last night. Here we go. So a lot of people are wondering why there's a new shape to the Powers bottle. Let me pull up the new bottle shape here. While I'm sipping on this, okay, here we go. So I'm going to share my screen. First time sharing screen here. Do, 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 do. Let's see if this works. Uh, maybe not. Okay, it's not really working. Um, I wonder if I can show, hold it up on my phone. But in any case, the um, the Powers uh, new bottles are shaped after the stills in the John Zane distillery. So the, those stills that sat on top of brick uh, furnaces that were fed by coal to, to, to heat them up, um, that shape is exactly the shape of the, the new Powers bottling. And Mel, would you be able to get me a bottle of the Powers Gold label, if you don't mind? We'll get that new bottling, because no people are interested in it. So I've got here the, the John's Lane release, which is single pot still, absolutely incredible one. So on the nose, sweet barley, some pears. Mm. Lighter on the nose than it is on the palate when it finally hits. Mm. Absolutely stunning whiskey, caramel, chocolate, coffee, leather on the palate vanilla, uh, a spice. There's a cedar wood for me that comes through whenever I try Powers John's Lane when I suck the, uh, no, the, uh, the gold label, the smaller bottle. 
Oh, uh, the new one, yeah, thanks. Uh, when I suck this through my teeth, the air through my teeth, I'm always getting cedar for some reason. Uh, massive fan of this. Uh, a great value whiskey. I think this is about $69 in, in, in Ohio. Um, uh, so, yeah, after the, the $30 rebate that people got at my tasting last night, it's only $39. Um, but, yeah, a massive um, a massive whiskey, an unbelievable single pot still whiskey, in some ways trying to hark back to the pot still of old. So Powers whiskey, when it was distilled in John's Lane in Dublin, would have been, for the most part, the whiskies that came out of there were single pot still whiskies. They played with grain in the later years before the John's Lane distillery closed. But when you buy a bottle of John's Lane, Powers John's Lane, this shaped bottle, and it comes in a lovely purple, kind of a wine colored box. Um, let me see if I have the box around here, I don't. Mel, I might have put it on the shelf. Is it down there somewhere? Small Powers bottle, gold label. But oh, there it is, look in front of you, to your right. P big Powers P, the diamond P, straight in front of you. That's it. Um, so when you buy the, the Powers John's Lane, it comes with this little insert, uh, which is a lovely, there's two thing, two sides to this. The first is an old line drawing map of the, or not a map, but a line drawing of the John's Lane Distillery, which would have covered about six acres in the city centre of Dublin, uh, founded in 1791, distilled there till about 1971-ish. Uh, so about 180 years of distilling history. But this little booklet gives you uh, a record of a visit by a man called Alfred Bernard. And Alfred Bernard was a, a whiskey historian, a British whiskey historian. And he was touring uh, distilleries in Ireland and England in the 18, late 1800s, and he visited the Powers Distillery which at the time would have been one of the largest distilleries in Europe, if not the world. Uh, it would have been producing 24-7, which was a rarity. It would have had three or more shifts of workers working around the clock to produce their pot still whiskey. But there's a remarkable line I've, or a paragraph that I've highlighted in here when Alfred Bernard visited um, the, the, the distillery. I thought it was a, a lovely romantic uh, description of his visit. And he says, on completing, our, on completing our tour of inspection over the distillery, we accepted the hospitality of the Powers family and did ample justice to a substantial luncheon. We had previously sampled the firm's whiskey of 1885, which we thought good and most useful, either as a blending or a single whiskey. But the old make, which we drank with our luncheon, was delicious and finer than anything we had hitherto tasted on our travels. It was as perfect in flavor and as pronounced in the ancient aroma of Irish whiskey so dear to the hearts of connoisseurs as one could possibly desire. And then there's a great line at the end and he says, and we found a small flask of it very useful afterwards on our travels. He was no fool, this Alfred Bernard, filling his pockets with Powers pots to whiskey in the late 1800s as he continued on his travels around Ireland. Um, but Powers... I use two words when I describe powers uh, and talk about the history of powers, and those are bold and heart. They made bold business decisions. They, um, they were the first Irish whiskey to bottle. In 1886, they opened their bottling uh, hall in Dublin. In 1889, they made a decision to uh, uh, launch the, one of the world's first miniature bottles, the baby powers. I emptied this last night when I made an Irish coffee with it. But the, the miniature bottle that we have today, we have powers to thank for that. And they made the bold decision in 1960s, in 1964, Frank O'Reilly, the, the co-chairman of Powers and a direct descendant himself of James Power, made the bold decision to assemble the families uh, that were existing in the distilling, distilling world in Ireland at the time. The only ones that were left, there were only three distilleries left in the Republic of Ireland in 1964. Jameson in Dublin, Powers in Dublin, and Cork Distilleries Company in Middleton. And uh, Frank O'Reilly had the, the bold idea that to save Irish whiskey, which was on its knees and almost extinct, he, had the he made the bold move to gather the families and suggest an amalgamation of the three families so that distilling could perhaps thrive, costs could be cut, and there would be some chance of competing with this lighter uh, grain, uh, lighter blend of Scotch whiskey that was taking over the world at the time. So that bold decision led to the closure of the Johns Lane Distillery in Dublin, the closure of the Bow Street Distillery uh, for Jameson, and the building of a brand new distillery in County Cork in Middleton uh, called New Middleton, the New Middleton Distillery, which opened in 1975. So they made very bold business decisions, uh, which uh, helped contribute to the saving of the Irish whiskey industry. Uh, but they also they operated with heart. There's great stories of how they took care of their employees, how they took care of their communities through the years, and how 
a job at Powers was really a job for life and a job that you kind of handed down to your your, your children and their children after you if they were lucky. Um, Powers took great care of their, their employees. Many great examples of that, including taking the roof of their maturation warehouses in the city center of Dublin and covering them in earth and soil so that the, the workers could farm their own food, could grow their own vegetables, their own potatoes right there on the roof of the maturation warehouse when uh, they couldn't have afforded their own land and they were living in the, maybe in a, in a very dense urban environment, which many of the laborers who came in from the countryside wouldn't have been used to. So a great example of how they took care of their people. And another one, that a great story that was shared with me by Carol Quinn, the archivist who has uh, who is really the custodian of the records of the Powers, uh, the Powers brand, and has pallets and pallets of journals and books and recipes and diaries and ledgers from the old John's Lane Distillery, showed me some uh, examples of tickets uh, from the 1890s. Uh, these were railway tickets that were given to farmers in Wexford. So um, the Powers family became very wealthy as a result of the success and the growth of their business, the growth of their whiskey and the expansion around the world and the demand for it around the world. And they, they had houses around Ireland, including in Wexford in a, in a village uh, called Oilygate. And from their kind of vaunted perch down in, in Oilygate, and they would have got their horse and carriage and perhaps the train down to, to their home, they would have seen farmers around their estate who had nothing to do with the Powers family, who didn't grow barley for them, didn't farm for them. They would have seen them using methods that would have been the same for hundreds of years. And the Powers family were big into innovation and bold new technologies for the time. And what they did was they paid for the farmers who, who tilled the fields around Oilygate. They paid for them each year to take the train up to Dublin to go to the, 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 um, the agricultural show that took place in the Royal Dublin showgrounds. They paid for their train journey, they paid for their lunch, they paid for their dinner, and they paid for the train home. So they could learn new methods of farming and maybe improve their, their little crop, their little lot that they had at the time. So the Powers family would have been very uh, well, well loved and, and liked by those who worked there and would have been held in high esteem. And so I think there's a reason why Powers became both, in early days it was the, the whiskey of the Royals and the Regals, and then later on it was the, the working man's whiskey because there was a great love for, for Powers, kind of an everyday Powers gold label was every man's whiskey. If, if you wandered into a pub in Ireland in the 1980s and you asked for a small whiskey, you'd have got a Powers. 100% you'd have been, you'd have been served up a, a, an old Powers. Um, so John's Lane is the flagship of the brand, 12-year-old uh, single pot still whiskey, an absolutely stunning, stunning whiskey. I'm going to sip on this now. Mm. So Laurie reckons that... Um, <laughs> and I believe this 100%, Alfred Bernard was a bit of a bluffer, a professional journalist who wanted an excuse for a jolly, so he went on a drinking tour of the British Isles at the time. Sir Laurie, isn't that all we all do? You with your podcast and me with my live streams, it's only a chance to drink whiskey, isn't it? <laughs> we're, we're all on some kind of a jolly. <laughs> uh, who could blame him? Um, let me see, Any uh, what comments have we got here? So Dahi, you're engaging in there with the comments on Pete, good man yourself. Um, Dahi's grandmother, incidentally, who we just had on talking about his whiskeys, his grandmother is a power and it's his go-to whiskey. Great stuff. Steve says, uh, thanks for sharing stories, history uh, and your knowledge this evening. Uh, yeah, look, I just love uh, the powers. You could talk for days about powers. There's so many great stories about them. Richard says that Irish distillers put out a several part podcast reenacting the history they did. Uh, this, I think it's called the story of Irish whiskey, which is very well, uh, very well produced and worth, worth checking out. Indeed. Um, let me see what other comments have we got here. Paul Kennedy says he loves the John's Lane. Connor says a lovely thick honey aftertaste. Does the spiciness come from the stills or is it more down to the ABV? Well, Connor, when you're tasting a single pot still, what I've been told is that the spiciness you get in a single pot still would typically come from that style of whiskey, from that unmalted barley component. There's a spiciness that's unique to a single pot still whiskey. Now, if you increase the ABV, you're going to get more heat and you're going to get a, 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 a layer of complexity that could be uh, deemed a spiciness, but this is bottled at 46%. So I believe that the spiciness in this is because it's a single, a single pot still, uh, single pot still whiskey. 
Steve says, let's get Barry to host a Stories and Sips trip to Ireland. Steve, once the borders and the cities and towns and pubs open up, you better believe there's going to be a Stories and Sips trip to Ireland. 100% there is. So um, absolutely stay tuned in the Facebook group as well for that or on Stories and Sips. So a lot of conversation about prices in different places. Um, Jonathan asks, is there any chance I could do a tasting in Ireland or we could get a rebate? Isn't it amazing that uh, how much more expensive whiskey is in Ireland than it is in the United States? I can pick up a bottle of a uh, Jameson cold brew. I've got a Jameson cold brew up on the shelf here behind me, top shelf, $19 a bottle. Cask mates I can get for $22, $23, which is not uh, expensive. Now, some whiskeys then are much, much more expensive. Redbreast 21, Redbreast 27. Those um, uh, Bushmills 21, the higher end products tend to be a lot more expensive in the United States, but certainly the more uh, affordable whiskies are way cheaper in America than they are in Ireland. Uh, let me see. Uh, Steve asks if I've got a link for upcoming trips. No, there's no link yet, but stay tuned. Uh, we're redeveloping storiesandsips.com at the moment, and we're hoping to launch in the next four weeks with details of uh, uh, where you can register your interest in trips and how you can engage more. So, yeah, that's coming soon. So let me know if you have any questions on Powers or John's Lane. Um, trying to think of a few more stories to share with you. But here's the new bottle. For those of you who haven't seen it in the flesh, this is the new shape of the Powers uh, on the Powers range. Uh, let me remove this comment so you can see it a bit better. So as you'll notice, there is a kind of a tapered uh, neck to it. I'm trying to find, I wonder if I can find a picture of the John's Lane stills. I'm gonna pull it up here to show you. Actually, the easiest thing for me to do now is take a picture of my screen and show it on my phone. Okay, so this is uh, where technology doesn't work for us, but I have a little workaround. So I'm going to hold up to the camera here. So what you'll see here are the old stills in the Johns Lane Distillery. In fact, those are still visible when you go to the National College of Art and Design, which is housed in the old Johns Lane Distillery today. This is the shape of the stills, and there were five big stills like that. Two or three of them are still outside. And I believe one of these, one of these copper stills, I stand to be corrected, is that not the still that is out in front of the Middleton Distillery in the grass in front of the old Middleton Distillery? I could be corrected on that. I believe somebody told me that one time. In any case, look at how similar the new bottle is to these old stills. Now, whether that means you like it or not is up to yourself. I've been on the fence until I got the bottle in my hand. And uh, my first reaction was, I don't know, <laughs> honestly, it was my first reaction. And then I held it, I looked at it. The label quality is lovely, very thick. Look at that embossing of the word powers there and the dim dimpling on the label, which I liked. And there's a thickness to it. There's a kind of a feel to it, kind of a solidness to it that uh, I wasn't expecting compared to the taller one. Now, is it as elegant? Well, that's up to you to decide, but it's a lot, it's very different. I think the Powers John's Lane is a very elegant bottle. Will this stand out more on the shelf? Well, we had a chance to judge that a minute ago when I sent Mrs. Stories and Sips in to find it. <laughs> she couldn't find it on the shelf. <laughs> and it's staring yeah, okay. and it's staring at her. <laughs> she's been drinking, she's been drinking whiskey. She has an excuse. But if this if this bottle was a dog, it would have bitten her. But it was staring at her and she still didn't spot it. I can spot it about 50 feet away from over here. But I think this is going to stand out on the shelf. I think it's going to uh, draw attention to it. Uh, people might have questions about it. And look, at the end of the day, does it matter the shape of the bottle? Inside it is what counts. And if this sells and if more people start demanding powers, then I think we should be, uh, I think we should be in, in good shape. That's all we want, isn't it? More people drink powers whiskey at the end of the day. Steve says he likes the old label. Yeah, I know it's, uh, it's tough to kind of move away from it. Maureen asks why the change to the bottle and the label. Well, Maureen, um, powers often finds itself playing second or third fiddle to other brands within the same portfolio. Jameson gets all the money uh, behind it in terms of marketing. There's not as much money certainly put into Powers. And so the Powers brand is not very well known in the United States. Um, there was a time when Powers wasn't exported to the United States. Uh, in this, certainly in the latter part of the 20th century, Tullamore Dew would have been imported. And there was a time when, or sorry, exported to the US, Tullamore Dew and Powers were part of the same family at one point. 
when the Tullamore Distillery closed in 1953, um, it was acquired or brought into the Powers um, stable. Uh, the, the rumor goes that it was a little bit of pillow talk at Teresa Williams, who was part of the Tullamore Dew family, the, the Williams family uh, who owned Tullamore Dew. She married Frank O'Reilly, who was the descendant of the powers of James Power, who ran, uh, who was the co-chairman of Powers. And they were married, so kind of marrying Powers and Tullamore together. And Tullamore joined the, the Powers stable. And Tullamore got the export money. And then Jameson got the export money. And so Powers stayed at home, kind of a domestic brand. So it's only recently Powers has started to kind of be seen on shelves in America. So for those who don't know what it is, it means nothing that there's an old label or a new label. They just need to know what's the whiskey inside and kind of how, how good it is and, and what it kind of represents and what its makeup is. So um, that's why there's a new bottle and a new label. They're trying to reinvigorate the brand, try and get some money behind it and try and get some drinkers behind it. Shane asks if the three swallows are still on the new bottle. So uh, they are not on the new bottle. They're not on the new bottle of gold label, but my understanding is, and we had this question last night, Shane, on our tasting, and, and the Powers team in Ohio weighed in very quickly to correct me. I said, they're not on this bottle at all. And they said, no, they're not on this one, but they are on the Three Swallows bottle, which will have the same, the same shape. So no, there's no Three Swallows on the gold label at all. Nope. Not at all. Uh, MP says it stands out great on the shelf as it's so different. Uh, and I, I think I'd agree with that. R Brian favors the old. He understands the shelf space play. Yeah, it's all about sales, isn't it, at the end of the day? Connor says that the new label will stand out with the younger generation. Powers is a drink our parents drank, and the new label will start to change that. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great if a new generation started to discover Powers? You're absolutely right. It was our parents' drink. I always tell the story about Powers being the drink we had in our house. We always had a bottle of Powers from my uncle, who was a priest. Could you get a more Irish story than that? The uncle coming in to visit us and, and asking for a glass of Powers and a drop of water, uh, Uncle Bob, and he always got his, his little glass when he visited us. So yeah, pure old man Irish drink in Ireland back in the day, but I'm hoping that changes with the likes of John's Lane, Three Swallow, and now this new branding maybe uh, will change that as well. Um, Haley Boning. My business partner in my non-whiskey world says that she hopes, uh, she thinks Mrs. Stories and Sips, also known as her sheltered inside, is doing a fine job of assisting. You're doing a great job. She's sitting here on the other side of the computer drinking a peated whiskey, having a great old time. <laughs> Paul says, an immense evening. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Great supporter. Love it. Uh, Julie says, love the story about the bottle. If it gets more attention for the brand, I'm all for the change. A wonderful drop in every expression. Absolutely wonderful drop. More pot still component in Powers Gold label than there is in um, in Jameson, for example. So if you like pot still whiskey, but you don't want to pay a pot still price, you get a good pot still component in Powers Gold label, which is a, which is a great thing. Um, Garrett says that it's a shame that Powers Signature is gone from the portfolio. It is. It is absolutely. Um, uh, and we don't know why, but we know that there are only three whiskeys left in Powers, and I'd love to be surprised by a new release this year. Uh, we've yet to see. So Stephen asks, how much does Scottish whiskey change? When Irish whiskey does, it's a crime. We have to recruit new people to Irish whiskey. Let's start acting like a worldwide industry, not just an Irish industry. I love it. Different label, same great liquid. Here, here, Stephen, 100%. Um, how bad at all that we have um, a company willing to invest in a rebrand and a repositioning. Uh, and interestingly, there are some, um, I don't know that uh, Powers uh, have shared any of this, but they're working with a number of bartenders here in the United States to create some really interesting approaches and uh, to this new brand and to the, the utilizing the old liquid, but intersecting that with some uh, new approaches to cocktail making. Stay tuned. I'm going to bring on a cocktail, um, an, an American cocktail expert in the next couple of weeks who's doing incredible uh, things with Irish whiskey in Chicago, where he's combining real historic approaches to Irish whiskey with scientific um, approaches to uh, molecular um, gastronomy and uh, molecular uh, approaches to um, to whiskey and to drinks. So we're going to bring him on a couple of weeks to do a little cocktail demonstration and how he's using fantastic old brands like Powers and, and revigorating them in, in a new way, which is which is a great thing. Joe Moore, who's never one to shy away from uh, giving us a comment every week here. Joe Moore, of course, is the um, Middleton representative in the Dublin airport. 
says the powers is finally getting its chance to shine on the global stage. Great new great, uh, global brand ambassador in Derek. Derek's a great guy uh, and the future is looking bright. So Derek yeah, is the global brand ambassador for powers uh, and no better man to share the stories of that, of that brand. So let me see. Quivine says, a wise red bearded man. Yeah, any, any red bearded man is wise, I'd say. Once told me that after a substantial survey in the US, the term powers had too many political connotations and therefore the marketing money was pumped into Jameson. It's amazing the number of stories like that that float around. Uh, I've heard that one before. I've also heard that the reason that Jameson got the marketing money was because it was a green bottle and that they thought that that would be more globally accepted as a symbol of Ireland. Uh, I don't know which is true. Um, I'm fortunate enough that uh, every now and again, Carol Quinn, the historian and archivist for Middleton, tunes into these live streams. And as she did today, she'll send me a little email and she'll say, I saw you shared a point there the other day. Uh, and without telling me that there's an actual truth, uh, that's, that there's a, 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 there's a different version of that. There's a more truer side to it. <laughs> she'll say, here's, the, here's a story you might not know about that. And she'll correct me uh, in her own uh, diplomatic style uh, and she'll share with me the real story. So who knows, if Carol's listening, maybe she'll share with us uh, through an email to me uh, or, or, or here in the comments why this is, uh, why Powers didn't get the money and why Jameson did. Jacob's at, Jacob asks if I'll give you a good story about Powers. I shared a few of them there. Um, let me see, what other stories do I have about Powers? Um, they, had a, they were one of the first distilleries in Ireland to have a football team. Believe it or not, the Powers football team in the early 1900s competed against other uh, companies uh, around Ireland. Uh, what else? They had a fire department in the distillery. They, um, let me see, there was a time, oh yes, the Three Swallows story is a good story. I know that's heard a few times, but let me grab the other bottle. So Powers, uh, these old shaped bottles, you'll see on the neck of the bottle, there are three swallows or three birds embossed on the neck of the bottle. And there are many stories existing as to why they are there. They've been on almost every bottle that has come out of the the John's Lane Distillery and then Middleton over the years, either in embossing format or on a label. But the story goes, according to Carol Quinn, who should know such things, the archivist, that there's a reason why these are on every bottle. And some people think it was to denote the age statement of the whiskey. If there was two swallows, it meant seven years or three swallows, it meant 10 years. But the, uh, the story goes that um, back in the uh, 1800s and early 1900s, the Powers family in Dublin would have been as well known for their horses and carriages as they would have been their distilling. In fact, in Alfred Bernard's account in this little document of his visit to the Johns Lane Distillery, he actually spends a whole paragraph talking about the stables and the quality of the horse hospital that was on the grounds of the distillery. But they were well known for their horses and carriages. And these horses and carriages were not for taking barrels of whiskey around Dublin or further afield, but it was rather to transport the Powers family to the dinners and affairs and dances and balls and things they would have attended and been invited to, the civic receptions and uh, events of the day, or to their homes around the countryside, to Oily Gate in Wexford. And each carriage would have had uh, three horsemen. It would have had a, a one on the front controlling the horses and then two maybe at the back who would have protected the carriage from any marauders or somebody trying to get hold of or rob the carriage. And the story goes that because those carriages were on call 24 seven, demanded at any time of the day or night by the Fowers family, they wanted to make sure that those men were well taken care of. And so each of those uh, horsemen would have been given a small little bottle of Powers whiskey. And inside of each of those bottles would have been enough to keep them warm, but not too much that they couldn't do their job. So the story goes that there was one swallow of whiskey in each of those bottles. And of course, with three men on the horses, on, on the carriage, there would have been three swallows of whiskey on the horses and carriages. Hence, fort three swallows were um, icon, iconically uh, portrayed on every bottle. Um, now that may be a, a good story. There may be a uh, 80% of truth to it. I love it as a story. I've also heard that uh, swallows signify the start or the, the arrival of the swallows signifies the start of the distilling season. There's many different versions of it. In any case, look, Irish whiskey and Irish stories are about uh, falling in love with a bit of a story. And uh, whether this is 100% true or not, I love it. And I'm going to repeat it until I am told uh, through a cease and desist letter to stop telling that story. But uh, Jacob, hopefully that's, uh, that gives you a little, uh, little bit of a story. 
Um, MP says that when the shutdown ends, he'll be doing a free Powers Three Swallow Bottle giveaway for the Irish whiskey fans of America to celebrate. Now, he's tipsy now, so if I forget it, <laughs> hold him to it. Everybody take your screenshots there of uh, MP's offer of a free Powers Three Swallow Bottle. Great stuff. Uh, Brian says, the truth never held back a good Irish story, and nor should it, uh, because there are, there are some great stories. Now, saying that, I, uh, the same historian who regularly uh, gives me fantastic feedback <laughs> and shares stories with me, Carol, said that uh, we don't need to make up any stories in the Irish whiskey world because the truth is actually far more interesting. And that's true. When you have two, 300 years of distilling history in Dublin and, and Cork uh, as part of the Irish distiller's portfolio, there's a lot to draw from and a lot that you can, uh, a lot that you can uh, fall back on. Richard thinks it's Blarney. Steve says, nothing like a good yarn. Maureen loves it. The truth never held back a good Irish story. Um, and Joe Moore says uh, that uh, it was originally a coaching inn. Yeah, so James Power, who founded the distillery, uh, it started as a coaching inn, and, and, and the distillery was founded on the, on the, the site there in 1791. Uh, but yeah, Joe, that's absolutely uh, right. I heard that story too. So Jacob, hopefully that gave you a good story about Power. So let me know what's in your glass if you're drinking a drop of Irish whiskey. Uh, let me know what you are what you are drinking. I'm sipping away now in this Powers John's Lane, and I'm enjoying it. The end of a week, gathered here, all of us, trying to remove isolation, and trying to enjoy a drop of the uh, drop of the good stuff together. So let me know what you're drinking, what you've moved on to. Good man, JJ. Great lock in tonight. He's had John's Lane in the glass now. Only two drams left. Sublime whiskey, succulent blend of spice and golden caramel, honey liquid. Mm, beautiful. Have you tasted the older powers? I have. I've tasted uh, not as much as I'd like to, but I have tasted some of the older powers. St. Patrick's Day, we did our first live stream to bring people together, and I tasted an old 15-year-old powers from Italy, which apparently tastes like poison, and was clearly given to me as a joke. But um, it, was, uh, it was a really interesting... Uh, blend. The older powers were distilled using much less efficient methods than they are today. So it's not unusual for older whiskies to not taste as good as even a younger whiskey would today because distilling has come so far in the past few years. Uh, so it's not unusual for those whiskies to not be as good as we kind of want them to be. So let me see where we have it today with the, or where we are today with the whiskies. Hermit on YouTube, green spot in front of the fire. No better place to be, Hermit. Good man. MP is back onto the Jameson signature. Great stuff. Williams onto his third glass of the John's Lane. I started with it in a old fashioned, which I, I have to come back to in a second. It's still sitting there for me. And I've got my drop of it here, which is lovely. Great to see the support for Powers tonight, everybody. Brian's got his three swallows. He's sitting in the rain in the hot tub. Very Irish weather in Ohio. Brian, I think um, whatever you do, don't send us a picture of that. We don't want to see you in the hot tub. But thanks for... Uh, giving us a nice visual there of where you are. John's poured himself a Powers John's Lane. Steve's got a Powers Three Swallows. Uh, Barton would love to hear the story about the Dublin fire. He's drinking John's Lane. Okay, so the let me see. The, the, there's a, the Great Whiskey Fire in Dublin. What year was that? That's taking me back to one of my early episodes of Stories and Sips now. Um, Mrs. Stories and Sips. Chief researcher has raced to the computer on the other side. The Great Whiskey Fire in Dublin. What year was that? 1875. 1875. Okay, so in the Liberties area in Dublin, which was originally the um, known as the Golden Triangle of whiskey production, there were four massive whiskey distilleries in Dublin around that time. You had John Jameson. You had William Jameson, a relative. You had uh, George Rowe, which was opposite uh, the Guinness Brewery and you had Powers. These were the four main distilleries. Also in that uh, area, because you had all of these distilleries, you had bonded warehouses. You had uh, rows and rows of wooden warehouses that were storing the whiskey that was distilled in this golden triangle. And as the story goes, in 1875, there um, a fire broke out in one of these warehouses. And whiskey is nothing more than a flammable liquid. And when wood catches fire that contains whiskey, well, as you can imagine, all hell breaks loose. And so in 1875, one warehouse in uh, the Liberties area of Dublin went up in flames. 
and uh, the Liberties is on is on a bit of an incline, and it slopes down towards the river. And the story goes that as the fire took hold in that warehouse, the barrels, of course, burst, and the liquid released from the barrels poured into the streets uh, outside these warehouses, which would have been urban warehouses right in the city center, homes and butcher shops and grocers would have all been situated in, in very close proximity. The story goes that the whiskey ran through the streets at a depth of about two feet. So 24 inches high of whiskey ran through the, ran through the streets on, on fire. So flames of whiskey. Uh, and it was threatening to destroy the city, threatening to actually burn down the city of Dublin. Such was the uh, intensity of this fire. And the story goes that there were uh, pigs and cows that were in stables in the city were running through the streets being chased by flames. And the uh, fire department at the time, the fire brigade and the, the police and the army would have been kind of British origin were based in the city. Their task was to figure out how were they going to stem the tide of this whiskey river that was flowing through the streets of Dublin, showing no signs of stopping. And uh, the head of the fire department at the time, uh, and I, I, I don't remember his name, but it's a great old story. The story goes that he had the bright idea to send his men uh, a few miles away to collect uh, a substance that had been scraped off the streets of Dublin every single day. And that was the, the dung, the horse manure, that had been left behind because back in the back in the 1800s, of course, 1870s, horse and cart would have brought you around the city. So the streets were full of horse poo. And that was scraped up and was brought to uh, sites on the outskirts of the city. So he had the bright idea of sending men to collect it. And they brought this manure back in the by the cartload. And they started building walls of manure in an effort to stop the spread of this whiskey river. And the story goes that it saved the city of Dublin by them uh, stemming the flow by putting horse manure to block the way. Now, 14 people, I think it was, died that night. And uh, apparently they didn't die from uh, flames. They didn't die from being burnt alive, but rather they died from drinking this whiskey that was flowing through the streets. So the story goes that the poor misfortunate Dubliners uh, who would have been living in extreme poverty at the time came out of their homes in the droves with every kind of vessel they could muster to collect up this liquid. The stories uh, go that they were collecting the, collecting the whiskey in boots and bowls and um, all kinds of, any, any vessel they could get their hands on and then drinking the whiskey. But of course it was boiling and it was on fire and 14 people lost their life, not from the flames, but from drinking overconsumption or overindulgence of the whiskey. So the story goes. So it's called the Great Whiskey Fire of 1875, and it's gone down in, uh, in in folklore in Dublin. And not everybody's very proud of how the Irish met their fate uh, with that with that story. Um, let me see. Joe's got some some details on it. Uh, James Robert Ingram was the fire chief. Five thousand barrels ignited. Thirteen people killed. None from smoke or burns. Alcohol poisoning was the killer. So I was one person off with a number of people killed. Um, and Barton says, thanks for that great story. It is. It's a great old story indeed. Um, Eddie says that the dubs invented pulled pork. <laughs> uh, and that's also a load of um, horse. Well, Eddie, tis, but sure isn't a great story what we want on a Friday night. <laughs> MP says, Friday used to be date night with his wife. Now it's Barry night. What does that mean? <laughs> Go back to your wife. <laughs> There's nothing to be gained from sitting here drinking whiskey with me. That's for sure. All right, so uh, Dublin Fire, uh, somebody else, yes, uh, Facebook user who was probably commenting from our Facebook group, drinking whiskey with their shoes to death, try hard alcoholics. Yeah, God help the poor the poor creatures. All they wanted to do was get an old drop of the old queer stuff flowing down the river uh, of whiskey. You don't get that very often. <laughs> there was another fire, a fire in the Powers Distillery, and I came across these photographs during the week, and I want to find out more about it, uh, but there was a fire that destroyed a good portion of the Johns Lane Distillery in the 1950s, to the best of my knowledge. And there's some remarkable photographs from the Irish Times online that I was pulling up as part of my research as I was diving into the Powers history. And uh, I want to find out a little bit more about it. Uh, but I know the Powers Distillery had a fire engine and a fire department on site. And there is a, the, the fire, is it the fire brigade, the fire engine history museum in Dublin, 
one of the one of the the fire stations in Dublin has the history of the the of fire uh, stations in Dublin, the fire brigade in Dublin, and they have the old powers helmets, which were the old fire helmets with the diamond P. So this big diamond P that's on the new bottle that would have been there on the right there in the front of the on the front of the helmets. Um, so Steve says, yes, there's plenty to learn from uh, horse manure. There is indeed. So aren't, aren't most of our Irish stories uh, using that ingredient as their main ingredient? Uh, a good story is all we want on a, on a Friday night. <laughs> uh, anybody else ever heard that story before? Uh, Greg is finishing a very a very heavy measure of three swallows and heading back to around back around to Powers Gold label. I do appreciate all of the uh, collaboration on the Powers drinking tonight, and you're not leaving me here to drink alone. Mrs. Sips, Stories and Sips is still working her way through the Peter Whiskey. How are you getting on over there? Good. She's doing well. She's <laughs> smiling. She's happy. She's got whiskey, whiskey, a whiskey glass in one hand, and there was a there was a wine glass there from earlier, was there? There is, yeah. Fair play to you. Fair play. Um, let me see. <laughs> Stephen says, I agree. Friday was date night, listening to herself talking. <laughs> ah, Stephen, listen. Don't be listening to me. It's far better that you listen to your loved one talking shite instead of me talking shite. Um, that'll stand you uh, much better in the long term. <laughs> Eddie says he can't believe it's Friday. I know Friday, these, these things come around very quickly. William says he loves a good story regardless. Uh, and Eddie thought it was Tuesday. So what does it matter anymore? Um, all, I'm queuing, I'm putting my, uh, I'm queuing my whole week around the few live streams I do between Haley, my business partner, uh, I do on a Wednesday and Friday, and then I do these on a, on a Friday as well for the whiskey side of things. Um, and uh, if I didn't have these live streams, I don't think I'd know what day it is at all. Dahi O'Connell, who still hasn't gone to bed, is delighted that Mrs. Stories and Sips is still enjoying her Bill Phil, her Peter Whiskey. You're a celebrity tonight, love. <laughs> I love that. For those of you who, who, who missed it earlier, Mrs. Stories and Sips got locked out of the apartment halfway through the tasting with Dahi, and there was a gentle knocking on the door. <laughs> so gentle. <laughs> I could hear it out of the corner of my ears, and I knew that must have been her. But she's back in now. <laughs> MP says to you all, you've helped me survive the shutdown with some education and some laughs. One love. Great stuff. MB, that's what this is all about. We're all locked into our homes when we should be locked into a pub. But while we're locked into our homes, can we not come together with our favorite whiskeys and have an old drink and enjoy ourselves? That's all we're trying to do here. Quivine says he's drinking more on a Friday night than he ever has. Barry's an awful influence. Quivine, I didn't buy that whiskey that sits on your shelf. I didn't pour it into your glass. So for those of you joining the dots there now together, you'll see a few conversations happening on Facebook between people. So you'll see uh, Stephen McGuinness saying that he, he doesn't want to listen to his uh, his better half talking to him on a Friday night because he'd prefer to come here. And then you'll see Siobhan Costello saying to Stephen McGuinness that she's upset with what he's saying. So now, I wonder, do these two know each other? You'll have to draw your own conclusions from that. Um, Joe Moore says he's almost sure the Powers Fire was 1961. Now, that's, that's a good point. I think it, it was 1961. I thought it was 1951. Uh, and yes, that's what I learned. The distillery wasn't running at the time, so no casualties, as far as you're aware. Yeah, that's what I saw as well. There's some beautiful, haunting photographs of firemen standing in, the, in, in what looks like a wooden beams, um, what looks like a roof, uh, standing in the middle of it, and the, the, the church on uh, John's Lane in the, in the background behind them. Uh, some really haunting photographs from the Irish Times, and I'm going to check them out a little bit more. There's Mrs. Stories and Sips weighing in. She's saying, it's, deli it's delicious, Dahi. And any American woman who can spell Dahi is a good woman. Fair play to her. Um, all right, so um, Eddie says, Siobhan is Stephen's ex. Well, after tonight, if she wasn't, Siobhan, um, Stephen's kicked to the curb, I'd say, choosing choosing Barry over Siobhan. I won't give you what you need there now at all. You, Get your whiskey and go back to enjoying your nights with your wives and your girlfriends and only tune in here if, if, if they're doing something else. But I can't get over to John's Lane. It's an absolutely stunning drop of whiskey and remarkably affordable compared to some of the prices of whiskeys we see coming out today, but 12-year-old single pot still for, um, yeah, um, 
$69 in Ohio. Would you believe I got this bottle for $44 in California on sale, which is absolutely incredible. Steve reckons I should get uh, Joe Moore on for Friday Night Stories and Sips. Joe, do you want to join in? I'll send you a link now in a second, Joe, and you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll have to put your money where your mouth is, and you'll appear on the screen beside me, and you can tell me about uh, that great fire of 1961. If you're up for it, let me know, and you'll get a, a link to connect within 30 seconds, and you'll be live on, on screen as well. you let me know. So Robert asks if, uh, let me see, he says he missed the peated whiskey piece. What was my thought on it? All right, let's bring back the peated whiskey. We'll talk quickly about it. Three years and 10 months old. Bill Phil, batch one from WD O'Connell. We had Dahi O'Connell on earlier. Dahi's job was, uh, his challenge, in fact, was to uh, try and convert me to the joys of Irish whiskey uh, that are is peated. And I've always been converted to the joys of Irish whiskey, but never been converted to peated uh, whiskey. Uh, and this was my chance to understand what I should be looking for, why I'm getting certain flavor profiles, why I dislike it at first. And uh, he talked me through the phenols and the process and helped me understand what I should be getting. I left the tasting of this intrigued and encouraged, but not won over. So people rave about Bill Phil. Um, I'm not there yet. Mrs. Stories and Sips likes it. She likes all pieces of whiskey. This is a light piece of whiskey, 14 parts per million compared to hundreds of parts per million for the likes of a, a, an Octomore, uh, or um, this would be one of the lighter peated whiskeys to my understanding. So um, it's not for me yet. I didn't dislike it, and I'm very encouraged by the education, so I want to kind of find out a bit more. But uh, no, Robert, I'm not there yet. I'm, I still have it in the glass. It's just if there was a choice between this now and Dahi's single malt 17-year-old, I'd go for the 17-year-old all day long. That's the beauty of Irish whiskey. There's enough to go around and there's enough for everybody. I'm not going to sit here and just because somebody comes on, on and shares their whiskey, me tell them that it's gorgeous and I love it. I, I don't love it, but apparently it's great whiskey. So that's for everyone to decide themselves. I tasted a very expensive peated whiskey in London um, last year, which was one of the most expensive Irish whiskeys ever sold at the time. And I didn't like that either. Uh, and so I'm not going to hide whether I do or I, I, I dislike it. And I'm not an expert. I'm always trying to make sure people know that because uh, there are people here, Joe Moore, Stephen McGuinness, Siobhan, Nick Ryan, Eddie Darcy, you all have Richard Dankovich there. You all have educated uh, palates and have been drinking whiskey a lot longer than I have. And so I'm going to take your cues and learn from you all. But I'm just, I'm on a bit of a journey and I'm learning and I'm going to try and learn from people who know a lot about little things like peated whiskey and bring them on here and teach me. So yeah, so it's not for me right now, but I'm going to come back to it. That bottle will not be thrown away or donated. And if Mrs. Stories and Sips doesn't drink it, sorry, this one, the Bill Phil, uh, then I'll absolutely be uh, horsing my way through that in due course to learn more about it. Uh, Nick says we'll always help. Uh, Dave Barber has joined us. Good buddy from Columbus. Shout out to the Dubliners. Good whiskey drinking music. Fair play to you, Dave. Good to see you. And let me see. Jonathan says it's after 2 a.m. Time for bed. Thanks for another great evening. Jonathan, thanks for joining. Much appreciated. And Nick says we'll always help. You're doing, Nick, honestly, you're, the amount of knowledge and academic knowledge that people like Nick Ryan, founder of Thoman Gate Whiskey, can add to the conversation is absolutely incredible. And I'm honestly uh, touched that I get to spend time with you all uh, and learn from you. Nick also shared that in 1880, a whiskey fire happened in Limerick in the Thoman Gate Distillery, which his whiskey is named for. 2,000 pounds of damage back in the day. Yeah, they were, there, were, there was no shortage of uh, fires back then, and they wouldn't have had the uh, fire retardation systems we have today. That's for sure. Everything made out of wood. Uh, Steve says, got, get it sorted with Barry. You've got a ton of knowledge and stories, and it'd be great to hear you share some of them. Uh, that's Joe Moore, I think he's re referring to. Yeah, Joe would have a lot of whiskey knowledge, uh, a lot of Dublin knowledge as well. Good, good Dublin man, Joe Moore. Um, MP says, I loved your truth, Barry. You're right, you're right, you like it or you don't. Yeah, that's it. Um, lots of things I do and don't like. And I'm the first to tell you that I'm very late to the red breast game. I've tried to make up for it in the last year, but I've been very late to understanding why red breast was a good whiskey. And that'll tell you how amateur my palate was for many years. But now I've I've been won over, and uh, that'll be the first thing I pull off the shelf at any, at any chance that I get. 
Joe says the only way he'll go on the big screen is if Mark Bergen is with him. Right, Joe? So here's the challenge I'm going to pose to you. You get Mark to agree to it, and I'll get the two of you on the screen, uh, and we'll talk about the Great Whiskey Fire, and we'll talk about all the fires, uh, and we'll talk about um, the Aviators, the Great Whiskey Society that is made up, that was founded by the whiskey, uh, by the, uh, the employees of the uh, Dublin Airport, which is another great story. So that would be a great old, old chat. So lads, if you're up for it, uh, Joe, I'll leave it in your court. You can message me and let me know if you're up for it. Let me know. Let me know. William Grass says he believes the stories in Sip's book is in order. Do you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to do a book on Middleton at some point. I'd love to write the history of the Middleton distillery. I've yet to find one single source of all the, the history of that, uh, that, that site from 1825 up to the present day. Uh, I'd love to throw my... Uh, throw my attention to that if I ever got the time. But uh, yeah, it'd be great to throw something like that together. Just fascinated by it. Let me see. Um, Eddie has been officially won over by the powers bottle. Yeah, it's different when you see it up front, isn't it? Or up close. Look at that. Look at that label, Eddie. Look at the dimpling on that label. And, you know, little things that I, as soon as I bought this, we picked this up last week. I, put, I jumped into the car once I got in the store. And just the way the label is cut off at an angle there, I thought... Geez, even that is nice. Like, it's a nice little uh, little design feature. There's just a nice symmetry to the bottle, and it's a chunky bottle. So it's going to take up a lot of shelf space. Really chunky. Almost twice the width of the other bottle, one and a half times the width of the other bottle, um, which is uh, which is great. So, yeah, so I'm still sipping away. And I've got two Powers John's Lanes in front of me. One is a, is the end of a old-fashioned cocktail, and the other one is my uh, Powers John's Lane itself. So what we talk about next, there's still 50 of you there, uh, 50 people still hanging in two hours and 10 minutes after we started, 51 of you. Is there anything you'd like to talk about? Anything you'd like to know um, that I can pretend I know or I can put it back on people like Stephen or Eddie or MP to answer the question who have far more knowledge than I do? MP has been on the sauce now for a while, I'd say, giving away whiskey left, right and center. Eddie Darcy, if governments allow, I'd love to buy you and your countrymen a whiskey. Um, I'd say that uh, nobody's going to turn down a free whiskey, MP, if you're buying. A fair play to you, MP. You're, uh, you're, you're promising great things tonight on the live stream. Dahi's out. Good man, Dahi. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. You gave us a, a great knowledge, a great education. Uh, shared your knowledge on your two whiskeys. And uh, I think that your, the American audience has been swarming to the online retailers to try and buy these. So good man yourself. I'm glad to see they're, they're of, of interest and they're piquing the interest of those of us on this side of the audience. Um, let me see. Um, all right, so here's a question that we can put out there that you all can answer in the comments. What is everyone's fantasy whiskey to try? Everyone's fantasy whiskey. So... Uh, I would love to try, uh, what would I love to try? A fantasy whiskey. I would love to know what that, um, those old silent distillery whiskeys coming out of Middleton taste like. So there's a 45-year-old silent distillery was launched this year, even though it's peated, it's lightly peated. I'd love to know what they taste like and, and how they compare to, to present day. Uh, that would be a fantasy whiskey for me to try. So everyone feel, feel free to, to weigh in on that. Um, let me see. Uh, Connor asks, outside of Middleton, which is the distillery that you're most excited about? For Connor, it's got to be Glendalock and their willingness to try different things. Um, Connor, I've mentioned this in a few of the live streams. I, I am absolutely thrilled and excited and impatient at the launch of Waterford Distilleries Whiskies. Uh, I chatted with their, uh, their agronomist, or as she calls herself, the crop walker. Grace O'Reilly yesterday, who's responsible for uh, working with the farmers, 80, 80 plus farmers that they work with to grow the grain, the barley for the distillery. She advises them on soil type, uh, on uh, barley type, on uh, fertilizer methods. I'm absolutely um, at the edge of my seat waiting for what comes out of Waterford Distillery. They were supposed to launch in April. They're now pushing back their launch to, uh, to September due to the COVID-19 but they, for me, are the most exciting, and they're going to change how consumers think about Irish whiskey 100% because their focus is on uh, the main ingredient in whiskey, which is barley. And today we see a lot of focus on wood and cask finishes. 
That doesn't mean they're not focused on it. It just means that they believe that barley is the greatest ingredient and that we should put our effort into that. Uh, so I'm really excited about them. Uh, let me see. Barton asks, uh, I've done all the tourist places. I think, where do I go in Cork to get a better understanding of Ireland? You go to a pub on Oliver Plunkett Street, Barton, called the High B. H-I-B, formerly the Hibernian Hotel. And the High B is a place of Cork history. You go in there, you're not allowed to open, you're not allowed to pull out your phone, don't be taking pictures, don't be on, don't be calling anybody. Don't talk loud. Don't talk loud. Thank you, Miss Stories and Sips. Uh, go in there, go straight to the bar and order yourself a pint and sit down at the bar. You could be sat next to the Lord Mayor of Cork or you, you could be sat next to a refuse collector. But I'll tell you what you will do is you'll have the crack. You'll have the Cork crack. And if you want to get a sense of Ireland and a sense of pure Cork, go into the High B and spend an hour or two in there midweek, seven, eight o'clock, Tuesday night. That's where you'll get pure Cork. And when you finish with that, where would you go after that? Uh, in Cork Mill. Um, Arthur Mains. Arthur Mains, yeah. More of a younger crowd. Arthur Mains pub. Bit of Cork. Um, Mutton Lane. Lane. Mutton Lane, yeah. Old Cork. Oh, and... Uh, I'll tell you what you'll do as well, Barton. You'll uh, go to, you'll do the Cork Whiskey Walk. Eric Ryan, who's a distiller in the Middleton Distillery, uh, who works alongside uh, Brian Nation down there in Middleton. Uh, Eric Ryan, who I'll be speaking to tomorrow, actually, uh, to interview him about the Cork Whiskey Walk, which I did last time I was home. You have to do the Cork Whiskey Walk. It could be done in about 45 minutes, but Eric makes sure it lasts about five hours. And there's a good reason for that. There's so much he has to share about whiskey in Cork and about the distilling history that goes back to the Cork Distilleries Company and the distilleries that merged together in the 1860s to form the Cork Distilleries Company. And I lived in Cork for 21 years before I, I, I moved out. And I never knew a fraction of the things he shared with me. And we'd walk down the streets in Cork and he'd walk me past buildings. And he'd say, look up there. And I'd look up and hidden in plain sight is the name Murphy and Son. Um, and that was the Murphy family that uh, were the owners of Cork Distilleries Company and eventually, the, the, of course, the, the owners of the Middleton Distillery. And so there's all these examples that Eric will share with you. So that's where you get a real good understanding of Cork, of Ireland and of, of whiskey history. Uh, Redbreast 32-year-old is coming up as a fantasy whiskey. Let me see. Uh, Redbreast 27, Maureen. You can see it on the shelf behind me, Maureen. Just behind my left ear. The ends of it. William shares my thoughts that he wants to try the silent distillery. If you can get hold of that. Siobhan would love to try the Middleton Pearl. That would be just wonderful. Siobhan was uh, present at the launch, weren't you, Siobhan, in Galway of the Middleton Pearl? Or the delivery of the Middleton Pearl to uh, the front door to Sonny Malloy's in Galway. Let me see... Joe Moore says, go to Drogheda and see Oliver Plunkett's head. Taking a twist there. Joe Moore, a, a bloody twist to the storytelling. Shane Cunningham says, lovely, loves the high B, lovely pint of beamish, great crack in there. Unreal. <laughs> it's an unreal spot. Can't wait to go back there. Absolutely can't wait to go back there. Um, what else? Oh, Eddie says he would love to try the Cadenheads, James Jamieson. And he's not spelling that the wrong way. That is what the label says. Uh, Caden Heads is an independent bottler that uh, buys has has a tremendous history of buying from distilleries and bottling under the Caden Heads name. It's a beautiful bottle, green label, and it spells Jameson incorrectly on the label. It's the only Jameson product that has ever had 27 years old on it. Yes, there's a Redbreast 27, but there was never a Jameson 27. But Caden Heads has a Jameson 27, um, and that is from the Bow Street Distillery. Very, very sought after. And very expensive. Wayne would love to try the uh, Middleton Pearl and the Silent Distillery releases. We're all in that together. We should pool all our money and have a small little sipping, little dramine when all this is over. I'm I keep talking up a big a big show here of uh, going to Ireland uh, when this is all over. But geez, wouldn't it be a great crack if we all met up and did one of these live and we cracked open a Middleton Pearl or something amazing? We all put thirty euros into the kitty and we all got a wee dram of it. That'd be unreal. Do, 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 do. Let me see. Richard Dankovich would love to see a cask strength in Middleton. Very rare. 
do, do, do. Shane loves the high B. Yeah, we said that one. I showed that one. Quivine says go to the Shelburne Bar in Cork. Un unbelievable collection. Yeah, absolutely. Go into Mark there in the in the Shelburne. He'll take care of you. Great collection in there. And uh, it, you know, it's almost not really a whiskey bar. It's a bar that happens to have amazing whiskey because you go in there and half the people in there are drinking pints. Locals from around uh, from around um, that that area around McCurtain Street in Cork. But go in there and then they show you the the menu and the menu is like a Bible. About 30 or 40 pages thick uh, of whiskey, which is unbelievable. Garrett says, go on to the Castle Inn. That'll be a pure cork night out, all right. Ashley says his fantasy is Dungorny in 1964. Can always get to nose it, but not to taste it. 70 euros plus a measure. Yeah, I had a sample of it in Dick Mac's pub in Dingle last summer, uh, and I think I paid about the same for a measure, maybe a little bit more, and I was determined to taste this amazing uh Two or three casks were, were ever, the, apparently this the marketing story goes whether it's truth or fiction again we don't let truth get in the way of a good story the story goes that uh, there were a number of casks were laid down in 1964 from the old middleton distillery by max crockett and his son barry crockett who became the master distiller after him discovered these casks lost because maybe they were the uh, the inventory of the distiller they would have been off the books so they weren't on the official inventory and Barry Crockett apparently walking the distillery uh, and walking through the warehouse discovered a number of casks. And in 1994, they bottled them under the name Dungorny. And 64, of course, was the year that they were bottled. So it was a 30 year old single pot still. And Dungorny is the name of the river that runs through the Middleton distillery that still gives a, a large uh, contribution to the water used to make the whiskey in Middleton and Dungorny, the Dungorny area is uh, a little bit further east of Middleton, uh, where many of the Middleton warehouses are. So Dungorny 64 is a lovely drop altogether. I have a bottle uh, in Ireland uh, hidden away for, for a special occasion. So Barton says, High B and the Whiskey Walk need to be on our visit in November. Yeah, so we talked about if we can get to Ireland in November when uh, Whiskey Live takes place, we'll do a bit of a Stories and Sips trip. Uh, we'll all meet up and we'll have a party within the party. And we'll do all of these whiskey things. So, uh, yeah, let's keep on. Uh, stay tuned here. Um, and we'll talk about that. Nick says, tell people to go to the tack room in Adair. Take you back to my early years. Yeah, where I learned how to make cocktails and learned how to pour pints in Adair Manor in Limerick in the tack room bar underground there. Great old spot altogether. Would love to go back there. Uh, Wayne loves the plan of us all going to, to Ireland. Let me see now. There's some horse trading going on here in the background. Stephen and Eddie are talking about, I've tried this whiskey a few times. I have a man. I think you're referring to the Jamiesons, Cadenheads, 27-year-old lads. Don't forget about your good old pal that you're coming here to tune in for date night every Friday. Uh, if you're getting hold of this kind of whiskey, wouldn't you put aside an old Dramine for your buddy Barry so that when he comes back to Ireland, he can join you for a sip? Don't be shy. Warehouse number 11, says Joe Moore. Joe, you're an oracle of knowledge. Would you ever come on the old uh, the old live stream and chat to us? Warehouse number 11 for Dungorny 1964. Great stuff. George, his favorite night was drinking at the Shelburne. <laughs> MP says, I'm going to meet my maker earlier than some. When I do, if my wife outlives me, this group will be happy with my donation. MP, there's no need to get uh, all... Uh, morose on us we'll, we'll hopefully live a long a good long life a good long life indeed george has got the right idea he's going to use his stimulus check from the american government to fund his trip to cork the cork people will thank you george maybe we'll see you over there so we got this question the other night uh, on our powers tasting as well and um, the thoughts on power single casks so for those of you that don't know there are bottles that look not too dissimilar to this that have ages on them from 16, 19, 18, 17, 14, 15 years old. Every now and again, Powers uh, releases a single cask. A single cask is, of course, just one barrel. And that one barrel uh, is typically sold to a bar or a pub or an organization. And they will distribute it or sell it to their members or their, their regulars. So there have been a number of single casks released from Powers over the last number of years. And my understanding is that there are 19 of them uh, today or maybe more in the, the range of single casks. And they don't make their way to the United States for good reason. There's only about 250 bottles would ever come out of a barrel. 
So there's no point in shipping them to America when they could be all snapped up in 24 hours in Ireland. So if you want to find a single cask, you're going to have to find locations in Ireland that have them, and some of them are better than others. Um, there are many single casks of powers out there. Some sold out instantly, and others have not left have have had trouble selling out. There is one in Cork uh, that the owners of uh, Arthur Mains have on their shelf that has uh, been there for quite a while that I had a taste of uh, that hasn't sold out. Uh, maybe people don't know it exists, but there's many uh, single casks out there. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you can get your hands on that. Eddie says this is exactly what he needed tonight. Can't wait to enjoy a couple of drams with yourselves when this is all over. The only thing better than enjoying a dram is enjoying it with a dram with your friends. Eddie, I couldn't have said it better. Honestly, this is amazing crack. Like I love this every Friday night. We don't know where the conversation is going to go, um, but sure, look, you're the ones in charge. You tell me where you wanted to go and what what we should do next. I have a great. Uh, a uh, few people lined up over the next few weeks that we'll bring in and then we'll have our, our, our chats back and forth after we talk to some makers and some distillers and some blenders. Uh, and we've got an episode of Stories and Sips coming out next week, uh, next Wednesday, all going to plan with Grace O'Reilly, the uh, agronomist with uh, the Waterford Distillery. And for those of you who haven't yet joined our Facebook group, I encourage you to do so. It's Irish Whiskey Fans of America. There's almost 4,000 people in that now, which is an incredible uh, number uh, that I never thought we'd get to. Uh, and you can go to Irish, let me type it in here if you can find it on Facebook. It's Irish Whiskey Fans of America, or you can just type in this URL, irishwhiskeyfans.com. It'll take you right to it. Let me go and put this up here now. Go to irishwhiskeyfans.com. Irish, American, German, doesn't matter. Most of our fans are in America. It's where I am. It's where I'm going to focus my time and energy on introducing more Americans to the joys of Irish whiskey. But I'd love your input and I'd love your contribution. I'm watching you, many of you in there on a daily basis, educating our American audience on Irish whiskeys. And I love to see the banter that's happening. There's no selling in there. There's no trading. There's no promoting of one's whiskey. It's all about contributing and it's about engaging. If you have something to offer, we, we want you in there. Uh, we like people to give more than they take. And we have a remarkable community building up in there. So I'd love, uh, I'd love you to all join us in there. Um, so I want to raise a glass to all of you. MP, raise your glass as well, good man. Cheers, Slauncha. Thanks a million for, uh, for joining me here on a Friday night. It's the highlight of my week. I'd like to do more of them. Uh, reach out to me on Facebook, on Twitter. You'll find me at Irish Whiskey Barry on Instagram or uh, Irish Whiskey BC on Twitter. And of course, Stories and Sips on Facebook and YouTube uh, and storiesandsips.com. So Slauncha, have a good all night. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. And I will talk to you all next week on this live stream. And I'll see you online between now and then. Slauncha, everybody. <laughs>